Hello, and welcome to Remember the Film, the podcast where we never take off our roller skates. My name's Josh. I'm joined, as always, <laughs> by Hugo. Hello. And by Grizz. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hello, guys. How, how are we all doing today? I'm doing great. Um, doing good. Doing I do good. want to give a little disclaimer here before we get going. We, we've had oh. a lot of technical difficulties here at Remember the Film. Ah. Uh, you may have noticed last week that Josh's camera has two big gray bars on the side. It's because he's not on his computer, because uh, his computer is dead. Uh, which Correct. is also why our audio is weird, because Josh is our editor and uh, d- doesn't ha- get a computer again here for another couple of weeks. So uh, we're recording differently, and then my mic died. <laughs> so now I'm using my actual gaming headset, which of course when it rains, sounds, it pours. sounds less great. So uh, sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's all good. I think that the the quality of today's episode is going to make up for any technical difficulties we may have. That's, I certainly that's my feel take. that way. Yeah. So when you were when you started that, you just said we have a disclaimer. I thought you were going to give like a content warning because you know we're talking about a <laughs> a, a less family friendly movie sorry. this week. I mean, so probably I mean, should. Uh, yeah. This is well, I mean, like family friendly movies. Like this, this we, episode, like the things we say, may be okay for kids to hear, but uh, right. definitely, <laughs> definitely don't let them watch there, this movie. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, um, there will be there will be a lot of penis talk, unfortunately, on this week's episode. So no, I mean, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll it's unavoidable. It a, it's unavoidable. We'll keep it to a, a gentleman, a gentleman amount of penis talk. I think nope. on this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll we'll keep it to under fifteen. <laughs> Uses of the word penis. Mentions We've already used of the three. penis. Okay. Four. We've all right. Used so, four. <laughs> all right. We're four. Uh, so, okay. If you're like a fourth grader for some reason listening to this right now, just pause the podcast, please, bookmark please it, don't. and then return to it in like 2027, and <laughs> we'll be all good. Um, yeah. Today we are talk. We're going to continue our trend of recent episodes of talking about movies that are tangentially related to our respective favorite movies. Most, I'm sorry, our respective most anticipated movies of 2021 uh so today's episode is related to a upcoming movie called soggy bottom that i am so excited about and uh soggy bottom what we know about it so far is that it's written and directed by paul thomas anderson and that it takes place in the 1970s in the san fernando valley so of course that means we have to talk about boogie nights which is also written and directed by paul thomas anderson and takes place in the 70s in the San Fernando Valley. And also, I forgot about this little connection. Um, Soggy Bottom is apparently about a high school student who becomes, like, a child actor and, like, becomes a star. And so, Boogie Nights is also about someone so who enters yeah. the entertainment industry and is a star immediately. So, I, yeah. uh, I forgot about that star, but yes. I wonder if this new if movie will end the same way as Boogie Nights. <laughs> 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 uh, well, I would imagine not. I would imagine we'll not. talk about we'll talk about the ending of Boogie Nights, but first let's uh, let's do some some boilerplate stuff about our our film to remember, which again is Boogie Nights. Uh, Boogie Nights is based on a a half hour mockumentary that Paul Thomas Anderson wrote and filmed when he was seventeen. He edited it on two uh, VCRs, and um, apparently he like made a lot of short films in, in high school and in his early 20s, and this was the only one that people saw and were like, hey, that's actually not half bad. And apparently the rest of according to him, the rest of them were terrible, and this is the only one that was not terrible. Um, yeah. His, like, he, he made it with, like, Which, of course, friend. means they, they were probably brilliant, right? Probably. Uh, were probably pretty good. I don't know. Like, not terrible. <laughs> he calls them terrible because, you know, he is I, him, but I, he, a, a lot of, decent. A lot of high schoolers make some really bad short films, and I'm sure... Yeah. Even Paul Thomas Anderson made some stinkers when he was 16. I'm willing to bet at least. I know I was involved um, with some terrible short be. films in high school. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, me too. But I mean, eh, they were okay. Um, so again, he, he basically just had like people he knew and his friends in the mockumentary. Um, his dad was the narrator, apparently. And um, the guy who plays the colonel in Boogie Nights, Bob Ridgely, he played Jack Horner in the, in the original short. And uh, actually, the mm-hmm. guy that the guy that the first time we see Buck Swope, Don Cheadle selling the stereo in Boogie mm-hmm. Nights, the customer he's trying to sell to played Dirk Diggler in the original uh, mockumentary. Oh, that's so great. Paul Thomas Anderson gave him that's like awesome. a walk-on role in in the actual Boogie Nights movie. That's cool. So, so again, like people saw his half-hour mockumentary and thought it was good. It was you know he got like positive feedback on like his other shorts. So he wrote a feature-length version of the script in the same like mockumentary like e e true hollywood story kind of format but um by the time that he like started to 
get heat and like get to a point where he could get movies made um he was kind of like tired of that format like he 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 did it because spinal tap was big in the late 80s and so he wrote it in the spinal tap style and made the half hour short in the spinal tap style but by the time the early 90s came around he, that that kind of style was kind of played out and he didn't want to make a movie like that so he reworked the script into a narrative feature which is what we see today and his original version his original version of the script was 300 pages and then he cut that down to Damn. 180 pages and um that 180 page version it was still really long <laughs> yeah yeah okay so uh a screenplay is usually one minute is one page so a 300 page movie is five hours and so he cut that down <laughs> yeah. to 180 pages which is theoretically three hours and we ended up with a two hour 35 minute uh Boogie Nights movie uh Boogie Nights released october 1997 budget 15 million box office 43 million so it, hollywood accounting is two and a half times the budget so it broke even even by hollywood accounting standards um, three Oscar nominations, yeah. uh, supporting actor for Burt Reynolds, supporting actress for Julianne Moore, best original screenplay for Paul Thomas Anderson. It won none of them. Um, mm. A famous, famous-ish thing about this movie is that Burt Reynolds allegedly did not get along with Paul Thomas Anderson at all and didn't like the movie and apparently fired his agent after the movie came out for bringing him this script. I think he also, I think he also refused uh, the role like a bunch of times before accepting. That's, that sounds possible. Uh, well, I think, I think, yeah, I think I saw an interview of him saying, oh, I re- actually refused this like seven times before I finally and, accepted. And maybe he just says that after the fact because, again, he didn't, he didn't like be, uh, the movie or the role. But, again, he got nominated for an Oscar, and that was, you know, Burt Reynolds died a couple <laughs> years ago, so it ended up being the only Oscar nomination he ever had or will ever have. Um, PTA, Paul Thomas Anderson, I'm going to refer to him as PTA, just heads up. Uh, PTA initially <laughs> insisted on both a three-hour runtime and an N17 rating, um, but producer Mike DeLuca requested he compromise on one of those two. And so he said, okay, fine, uh, I'll try to get it down to an R, because uh, Blockbuster, does, Blockbuster doesn't carry NC17 movies, they only carry R and lower, so... They were worried about yeah. how much money they would lose in the back end if they released an NC-17 movie. Which is funny to me that, like, what Blockbuster does or doesn't do is, like, factoring into major studio decisions <laughs> in the late 90s. It yeah. seems like such a, such a relic of another time. I mean, it makes sense, given... It absolutely know, makes sense, yeah. I mean, we obviously... And people, especially for this type the of movie. The way to watch movies for a lot yes. of people, you know, I mean... Obviously, you could go to the th- the theater and, and watch a movie there, but, you know, for a movie like Boogie Nights, I imagine... Uh, if you heard what the movie was about, there might have been some trepidation about actually going to see it in theaters. Absolutely, yeah. And well, not uh, it's just that. Just... And it's also just a niche type of film. And uh, and I feel like it's the type of film that once it gets Oscar nomination and it gets Oscar buzz, then people want to see it. And if if they're able to by you know renting it at Blockbuster, that that becomes a second source of income. For yeah. Them. Right. Kind of I mean, makes the, sense. A- the aftermarket for movies was just. A, a much different consideration 20 years ago than it is now. And I kind of, honestly, I kind of miss when it was like this, but that's just me yeah. being a millennial, I guess. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the final product, he compromised and said, okay, I'll make it rated R. But then the final product didn't end up, he didn't even end up being three hours. Anyway. It was two hours and three, five minutes. And uh, my last note in the boilerplate section is that this movie includes possibly the most famous prosthetic in movie history, which is <laughs> a reference to the, final shot of the movie which we're not in the spoiler territory yet but if you've seen it you know that it's a famous <laughs> famous shot, yeah famous yes. prosthetic yeah it's certainly <laughs> memorable very yes. memorable films to remember <laughs> the ending scene of Nights. um yeah so uh i i love this movie but i'm not gonna i'll i'll sit on my pain for a minute or two and i want to ask you guys uh hugo where are you at on a uh, book nights so book nights um I watched it again uh, this morning, and I had uh, the f- it was the second time I've seen it, but I, I, it was stuck in the in 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 the back of my mind for a while, uh, even before we decided to do the podcast. Because the first time I saw it, I, I I started thinking that I didn't give it a fair shot, because the first film I ever saw by Paul Thomas Anderson was The Master, um, mm. and the reason I watched it, I, I'm not sure why we chose that, but it, basically there was a screening of There Will Be Blood. And we just wanted to watch a few of his movies before we went to see the screening um, in my university town. And so I watched The Master, and it sort of left me with a bit of a bad taste in my mouth. Uh, and so I can't I, imagine I think, why. Yeah, and I think watching Boogie Nights, <laughs> I, I kind of um, 
went into Boogie Nights feeling some of the annoy or some of the annoyance that I was left with uh, from the master. And so I, di I didn't really enjoy it that much at the time. But now watching it again, I think it's it's brilliant. I think it's mm. uh, one of his best movies. Um, and especially considering like this is his second feature film. He was, I think, 26 or 27 years old when it he made ma this. It makes me mad how young he was when he made this movie. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's crazy. Like, yeah. It would be for me, it would be next year. Yeah, yes. let's make this. And it, it feels like, especially in the filmmaking, it feels, let's, aside from the subject matter, which obviously is mature, but the filmmaking itself feels so mature and so sure of itself. I completely it's, agree. It's yeah. Really, really, really impressive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It is. How about you? Grace, where are you at on where are you at on Boogie Nights? I, I enjoyed it. I, I don't think it rises to the level of masterpiece in, in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very good, but I think there's some pretty obvious drawbacks, and uh, we will definitely talk more about that, but I'll just, you know, in a non spoilery way, Mark Wahlberg is uh, a bummer on this movie. Like he, he just doesn't <laughs> bring anything. He doesn't bring anything to it. And um <laughs> Yeah. So, I, I th go ahead. I think I said to you guys in the chat before we got on mic that I think Mark, I don't think Mark Wahlberg is that good in this, but the movie's good around him. And I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, there's some really stellar performances uh, that I, I don't know if we can, I can talk about all of them without getting into the spoilers uh, part of it. Well, just we can sit on it for a second. Yeah. Um, but there's there are some stellar stellar yeah. performances yeah. Uh, from from some people, and but then there's other stuff that I just kind of like I'm uncomfortable with. And like, I know mm. that's kind of the point for some of it is, you know, especially for Paul Thomas Anderson, a lot of his movies are about making you feel uncomfortable about the characters and what's going on with them. Uh, and that worked, but that makes it less fun uh, mm. to me in, in some ways. I wanted to say that uh, one of our listeners, uh, my friend TJ, shout out to TJ. Um, he but follows he you on letter. He follows you on Letterbox, and he texted me the other day saying, "I saw Grizz only gave Boogie Nights uh, four out of five. Is that four out of five, it? yeah." And he's like, "And we're like, well, that's that will not stand. <laughs> you only, <laughs> that you only gave it four. Yeah, I mean that's that's a that's a pretty good rating, guys. <laughs> it is a pretty good rating. Uh, it, this is just a, uh, I, this is a five out of five for me. But it's just like that's also just like what's in my heart. Uh, this movie is a." You know how in Inside Out people have like the concept of core memories is something from Inside Out. Yeah, this is like a yeah. this is like a this is like a core movie for me. Like this is one of the foundational texts mm -hmm. of my love of movies because just based on when I saw it and like the context in yeah. which I saw it. Um, I, I mentioned before that there was like a summer when I was like eighteen when I had a Netflix subscription, the the DVD Netflix subscription again, mm -hmm. uh, millennial, and uh, I just spent that entire <laughs> summer. I just spent that entire summer in my room every night, just like I just discovered that movies existed. So I had to like seek out movies from before I was old enough to watch movies. So like that's you know when I yeah. saw Pulp Fiction for the first time and Fargo and 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 all these and and Boogie Nights was among those. And like again, that's like a a foundational text of how and why I came to love movies. And that's um, you know so it's it's up there for me. Um, I don't know, like, I just watched it again this week. Uh, it's just so, like, uh, it's just fun. Like, it it's is fun. Color it's, it's colorful, and it's, it's, it's vibes. It's so vibes. Like, this movie's such vibes, if I can <laughs> use incorrect grammar like that. Um, it's, and, and I love that. And, like, it's, it's, it's colorful, it's fun, it's flashy, it's fast-paced. Not boring for a second of its 155-minute runtime for me. Not boring for a second, which is... Which is crazy. Yeah. Um, and, uh, like, I think that I like looking at the other movies that I really, you know, the other foundational texts, you know, Goodfellas is certainly one. And, like, this movie mm -hmm. is basically Goodfellas in its it structure. Is. And that yeah. it's someone who's, like, dissatisfied with their life, enters this new world that's, like, fresh and exciting and is taken under the wing of these new people that are fresh and exciting. And for the first half, it's amazingly fun and, you know, you're, you're sucked into it. And then the second half is just this giant downfall of... Yeah, and you the, see the other half. Exactly. And that's exactly what Goodfellas was. It's exactly what this is. And I guess, I don't know, maybe I respond to movies like that, but um, I just eat it up. And, um, yeah, and it also mirrors Goodfellas, even in the ending, not to spoil it, but um, just well, the way the ending is, it leaves you with a, a sense of, 
I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to feel right now for this character. Yeah. I'm not supposed to, am I on his side? Am I not on his side? Mm -hmm. um, am I happy with this ending? Am I not happy with this ending? And it leaves you with those questions exactly in the same ways as Goodfellas and another movie that's Wolf of Wall Street that I think follows a similar structure as well. So you're okay. So just you just mentioned two Scorsese movies. One thing yeah. about Boogie Nights, particularly because again, Paul Thomas Anderson was like 26 or 27 when he made it. He really wears his influences on his sleeve. So you can see just a ton of Scorsese influence in this. Uh, he specifically has cited Jonathan Demme as like mm. a bigger influence than Scorsese. Um, I'm more familiar with Scorsese's work than I am with Jonathan Demme's work. But like what I know of Demme, I can definitely see it here. But I sure as hell see Scorsese here. Um, I think Wolf of Wall Street is a good comparison. As I said, Goodfellas is a good comparison. Hugo, you mentioned the ending being similar to Goodfellas. Have you guys seen Raging Bull? Yeah. I have, the yes. End, the ending is the exact ending of Raging Bull. Same camera angle, same uh, yeah. scene setup. Like, Agreed. And, you know, A couple Raging of subtle ends, differences. Uh, very, very <laughs> subtle differences, though. Like, yes, yeah. okay. Robert De Niro doesn't pull his, Robert De Niro doesn't yeah. pull his hog out in the mirror at the end of Raging Bull, but... But, but, I'm but, gonna count that. I'm sorry, I'm okay, gonna count that's that. Five. That's five. That's five. Robert De Niro, though, at the end of Raging Bull, this, you know, spoilers for Raging Bull, I guess, it ends with Robert De Niro giving a monologue in front of, in front a, of mirror, a mirror, and it's a, a he's, yeah. he's practicing for a performance he's about to give, and he is mm -hmm. unselfconscious about the fact that he's monologuing about himself. He doesn't, yeah. he doesn't realize that he's doing that. And then he stands up, buttons his jacket, and then shadow boxes before he leaves the room. Yeah, and that's, yeah. That's literally like, exactly what happens. One hundred percent. It's like beat yes. for beat what happens in the end of Boogie Nights. Um, plus uh, the most famous prosthetic in <laughs> movie history. <laughs> on top of that, um, so You're dancing around this and it's hilarious. We're still not in spoilers yet. But it's fine. Um, another <laughs> thing I, I like about this is uh, this movie is a lot. Like there's there's a lot going on in this. Not oh, just yeah. you know they don't just fit like six years of story in two two and a half hours, mm -hmm. but also like. Um, a lot of different tones. Like it's really dramatic. It's really funny. It's really endearing at times. There's like a lot of tenderness, mm -hmm. and then it's also super tense at times. Yeah. Like yeah. the 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 half hour scene in the in the back third of this movie is like holy crap, <laughs> intense. Yeah, and um, not just tense, but it also gets kind of disturbing at points with you know yeah. with certain. It's like, um, it makes you feel really uncomfortable at times, and, it, and it's it, and it's not so, all about so one well. character either. Like <clears throat> they're exactly, they're telling yeah. a lot of storylines for all the characters, which is w probably yes. why they ended up with you know two nominations for best supporting actor because there was yeah. so much to do with those supporting characters. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, I want to. So I already mentioned that scene in the last third. Let's set aside that discussion because I want to talk about the scene in, in detail, but not until we're in the spoiler section. Um, yeah. How many how many amazing needle drops are there in this movie? Like particularly, like, I'm thinking about so the, the pool party scene. The pool party yeah. scene at the start of Act Two is just like banger after banger after banger after banger. It's almost like there's almost too much music. I'm, yeah. I'm not going to yeah. complain about it, but it, like I said, it contributes to the vibes. And yeah. It's an um, excellent, say, excellent soundtrack. Like the, in addition to the 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 song. Sorry, Mando yawned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that was adorable. Uh, <laughs> In addition to like the songs from the '70s that they pull in to the movie, the score is also really good. Very like very good builds excellent tension in, in the parts where you need that. Uh, so all around, the music in this is fantastic. Yeah, I'm thinking specifically about the score uh, in like the Dark Knight of the Soul moment. It's cross cutting between Dirk in the pickup truck and Heather yep. Graham and Burt Reynolds in the back of the limo. Uh, not to spoil what those scenes are, but like the there's like a, a like a bell that's ringing, yep, like a church bell almost, and yep. it's it's so good, it's really effective. Um, my my favorite needle drop is, and I wrote this on the outline as well, is when they use I I uh, I fooled around and fell in love. Yeah, when is that? Uh, that's when. Okay, shall we go into spoilers? Let's go into so spoilers. I can get to this because sure. I mean we we've talked around it. Yeah. Okay. Spoilers. Um, they use that song when when basically um, what's he called? Little Bill's wife. Yes, uh, is is having sex outside in front of everyone, uh, and okay. the song is a fooled around right. okay. and fell in love, <laughs> yes, and it's just him it. looking at his wife, just yeah. doing it with another man in front of twenty people, right. and then the scene continues without a cut because the camera pulls back. This movie is, I don't know, there must be like seven takes in this movie overall, two and a half <laughs> hours, seven or eight takes. Uh, they're so long and they're so good, well, takes, and yeah. the camera pulls back. And it's him talking to the producer, and the, he, the producer just wants to talk. About, yeah, just wants to talk about yeah. 
it wants, the lighting wants, him, wants to talk, <laughs> talk about the lighting and he doesn't care at all but he keeps them there and he's like oh little bill he that's how this happens don't don't worry about it yeah <laughs> and he's so mad i love that scene it's so funny yeah there are a lot of uh long shots in this i've run the outline that there's yeah. a lot of look what i can do shots is what i'm calling them because like yes Paul Thomas Anderson is like, I shouldn't call him a kid, but like, you know, I'm old, I'm well older than he was when he made this. So I can call him a kid, I guess. But like, mm. he's a kid with something to prove. Like he's got this, this big yeah. budget and all these actors and he's going to show them what he can do with his, with his camera. And he does some really impressive stuff. The opening shot uh, begins on a marquee outside of a club. And then it lasts for like three minutes as you boom down to the street, the move club. into the club and you meet everyone. You meet everyone you're going to meet in the movie in that two minute opening shot. It's, it's really yeah. remarkable. You start by meeting Burt Reynolds, you meet Louis Guzman, you meet Julianne Moore, you meet Heather Graham, you meet John C. Riley and Don Cheadle. Then you end up on Eddie Adams, uh, Mark Wahlberg. It's, it's really and incredible it, what, he, and it, what he does. And it also gives you just the basic idea of what their character is. Mm-hmm. Just character wise, because yeah. you see, you know, um, John C. Riley's character, he's dancing, he's the fun guy. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, you see Maurice, who's the, the club owner, who's who's going to talk to, to Burt Reynolds because he wants to be involved in his business. And, you know, it, you it see, gives you a brief see, idea of it's like you yeah. see Amber be motherly towards Roller Girl, yeah, uh, exactly, just in that yeah. opening shot. Um, yeah, I, I watched I watched the first like half hour of this movie with with the commentary on Paul Thomas Anderson's commentary, mm. and he mentions that like. You can't really hear any dialogue in that opening two minute shot, but like you kind of don't need to. The only line that you really hear clear that you really hear clearly is Julianne Moore asking Heather Graham, "Did you call that girl today?" Which is like a, a very succinct but good way to show that these two like know each other very well, and also mm-hmm. she's looking out for her, and also this, the fact that they don't even need to use nouns; they just be like, you know, they they're talking very yeah, yeah, yeah. familiarly um immediately which i think is 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 good succinct uh storytelling um we're into spoilers now right yes we are yes so the uh the coke scene with alfred molina in the in the last oh man what a (laughs) scene Um, (laughs) this is uh, honestly it's 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 one of my favorite scenes from any movie of all time i i can't hear sister christian by night ranger and not immediately think of alfred molina in his bathrobe (laughs) waving gun around so that's my cross to bear, I guess. Um, that said, I'm not sure how much that scene fits into this movie. Like, it feels like it's just, like, lifted from an entirely different movie and just placed here. And, like, honestly, if you removed that 25-minute sequence, the movie still, like, makes sense. Like, it's yeah. Dirk. Dirk hits his lowest point in that um, pickup truck. And yeah, then it does. And then this scene happens, and then he goes crawling back to Jack asking for forgiveness. But, like, if he just had the pickup truck scene and then went back to Jack, that still kind of makes sense. It would still and make like, sense. Yeah. So like, well, I mean, I'm not going to complain about it. Cause again, it's like the, the scene is like a standalone, just unbelievable uh, tension yeah. and, and just awesomeness. It, but yeah, but it does think? feel, it does feel like he's lifting sort of a Tarantino like scene and it putting it into place. the movie. Yeah. It, seems like a little he, out of it, place. it does seem like, Oh, I, I feel like he wanted to, to push, boundaries with this film and he didn't have a lot of violence up until then so he wanted to insert one violent scene in there one scene of tension two violent scenes yeah fair enough but you know but and i don't know and i agree and i sort of that's one of even though i think alfred molina is so good in that scene amazing he's amazing he's so good over the top and crazy and i love him (laughs) Uh, but i I do agree that it it does feel a little place and also which is one of my other criticisms of the movie. I think uh, Mark Wahlberg's character is the one in the film that I actually care about the least. Mm. So spending that much time with him is less interesting to me than any scene that we get, for example, with uh, either Burt Reynolds or... Yeah, but you know, you're also, worried, you're also worried about Reed Rothschild getting out of that house alive as well. Definitely. So, you, know, you got Definitely. John C. Riley there. Yeah. Grizz, what do you think about that? Well, so I was going to say, I, I kind of disagree. Like, I... I think that this scene helps push him to go to Jack, go back to Jack, mm-hmm. because it's like, okay, he, it wasn't his lowest point in that truck, because that was stuff that he had done previously, back before, before. he'd gotten true. famous, this, that's that, was, true. that was something that he had done before, so this mm-hmm. couldn't that's be true. his lowest point. His lowest point is, now he's, you know, so, you know, addicted to cocaine, and, you know, his life is in shambles, that he's going to participate in a scam uh, to get 
to get some money and you know and not just a a scam but a very dangerous one where you were scamming a guy very dangerous a yes. very dangerous man right yes. and uh so i think that that is when that doesn't pan out and he's getting shot at and you know and his friend is killed you know he yeah. <laughs> that's rock bottom <laughs> he's like okay now i got to go back to jack that's a good point i like that point cuz i guess you know Dirk runs away from Jack around the midpoint, a little after the midpoint, when he like his pro his ego gets too big um, in the yeah. in the second half of this movie, which that, that that's good stuff. But, but it's then not he, just like, the ego; it's also the amount of drugs that he starts doing. Yeah, right, that drive him. But mad. I mean, the, the the point where he actually quits is that like he yeah. thinks I don't I don't need you. I'm, I'm a bigger star than than you are. Mm-hmm. So, um, but then he like he tries other avenues to keep making money uh most hilariously as a music star Sing which yeah. <laughs> those scenes great. are amazing and those uh, scenes are so good you got the touch great song um well, and it's so funny <laughs> it's so funny because you know of who mark Wahlberg was exactly. he was a music star <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes yes so i guess i guess the coke scene could be him exhausting all of his post jack corner avenues the first one being music second one being mm-hmm. you know what he was doing in the truck third one being drugs so which yeah, i gotta okay, say that's a like pretty that pretty quick fall there there's like okay yes. i can't be a rock star so now i'm gonna go jerk off in trucks in front of people <laughs> <laughs> hey man you know play to your strengths right <laughs> yeah he goes, goes back to what he knows you like, know go back, back to being a bus knows. boy dude like <laughs> He was he was a bus boy who also had extracurricular activities, if you know what I mean. You know, including uh, trucks and and cash and you know. <laughs> um, I I like that though. That's a good that's a good point. That's 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 a good defense of why this scene is there. And, and plus, just, I, I, I want to defend that scene because it is my well, favorite yeah. scene in the movie. Like you easily. don't really it's need great. to defend it. You don't need to defend it. It's awesome. It it defends itself. Mm-hmm. Like it's again and just an unbelievably awesome scene. I just think that um, like Thomas Jane. You know, one, I didn't know he was in this movie. This was the first time yes. I'd, I'd watched this movie. And it, his performance was really good. And I can't Amazing, believe it yeah. took so much really longer good. after this movie for him to gain more prevalence. Because, uh, mm-hmm. like, this, like, the way, uncomfortable way that he demands, you know, yes. money, <laughs> or demands he go open the safe, is like, right. this is really well performed. And then, yes. oh, mm-hmm. man, Alfred Molina. Like I'm with him. Just the the, the drum un- beats, unbelievable. Yeah, <laughs> and the dude, the dude, uh, sh- throwing the fireworks. The fireworks in this, like, I've seen this movie. Oh god, I don't know, it's so stressful. Four oh, or man. five times, and I was I was watching this week, and like during that scene, I was still like jumping every time there's a firework <laughs> going off, even though I I've seen it. Um, and just like the that's ah, Cosmo. He's Chinese. Just like that's when they, yeah. <laughs> the justification. So <laughs> uh. It's so good. And again, I, I can't hear uh, Sister Christian by Night Ranger and not think of uh, Alfred Molina right. and his mustache and his gun. His, his sweaty. He's so sweaty. He's so sweaty. <laughs> he's so sweaty. <laughs> um, and I get it. He's like, he's smoking crack or whatever he's doing. So, I mean, yeah, that, yeah. that'll make you sweat, I guess. But, um, yeah. okay. I, I wanted to ask you guys about something. Um, especially, Grizz, because you've only seen this this week for the first time. Um I, Boogie Nights has been with me for so long, and I've like, you know, thought about it in so many different ways before. That like, I kind of like sometimes forget that it's about the porn industry. Mm-hmm. Like it, like that is just so the the movie itself is so divorced from its subject matter in my mind. Like when I think about Boogie Nights, I think about like the themes, I think about the characters, and like the the American dream and the rags riches story and the Goodfellas structure, and like you know, I think about all that stuff, and like you know the changing world 1970s to 1980s like those are the things that i think about when i think of boogie nights and i kind of i kind of like again take for granted it's about pornography so like you know what do you guys think how 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 much of that is like is that is part of the movie for you uh i wouldn't say that it's necessarily like a huge part of it i think Mm -hmm. a lot of the comedic beats come from it being about pornography and yeah so like like when he first first meets the colonel Oh my God! So good. The, the, I don't remember the exact line, but you know. May I see it? May I see it? Yeah, it's just very yes, matter yeah. of fact. <laughs> yeah. Very matter of fact, and that—that's a comedic. Thank beat. you, Dirk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It was—it was, it was a comedic beat that you—you you couldn't do if this movie wasn't about the porn industry, 
right. but I think because of the way the film is shot and performed, you you go through moments where you kind of forget that it's about pornography, and then they yeah, bring in one sure. of those comedic beats, which yeah. is which is inherently tied to the pornography, and you're like, oh yeah, that's right, this guy's a porn yeah. star. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, I want to shout shout out one of my favorite jump cuts in movie history, which is after they shoot. Dirk's first scene with Julianne Moore and uh, Dirk references shooting, filming something that would happen at the end of a porn scene, and then they yeah. immediately cut to John C. Riley opening a bottle of champagne that yeah. bubbles over, and that's <laughs> that's yeah. a clever cut, that's I think. Uh, Hugo, great. where are you at on on all this stuff? Um, I I think the the yeah the porn setting is is a huge part of the comedy of the film, and yeah. I think it also allows. Paul Thomas Anderson to to try some weird stuff like to to get him and brilliant actors like Julianne Moore to pretend they're terrible and he's making this really cheap really crappy film uh, say so like sort of action porn film and you see the difference with Julianne Moore acting in the porn scenes where she's terrible like she's yeah. so good at pretending to be a really bad actress yeah. And I think that's brilliant. And it's probably pretty it's easy to do because yeah. she just had to look at whatever Mark Wahlberg was doing and do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I think, okay, I don't think Mark Wahlberg is, te- let's talk about him. I think that's, sure. that's yeah. big thing. I, I don't think he's terrible. I just think he's so monotone that, and you, can't, you don't see the difference. The way he's acting in the film feels pretty much the same as when he's acting in the fake porn scenes. Yeah. And, on the other hand, you see a complete difference in what the other actors are doing when they switch to those porn scenes. And I'm the fact that he's the protagonist of the film drags his performance, make, makes it sticks out even more because he's surrounded by brilliant actors, especially, I, I don't know, I, Burt Reynolds, so good. Philip Seymour Hoffman, Hoffman <laughs> he's just amazing. Like, in every, He's just the best in Scotty in, J. Yeah, he's in several, he's in several Paul Thomas Anderson movies. And if you think about it, each and every one, he's a completely different character, and it's yeah. you can barely tell that it's the same actor. He's so so good, and you, so you could you, you could remove Scotty J from this movie and not really lose a ton, but like yeah, but, Paul Thomas Anderson like wants to put these people in his movies, so he finds yeah. parts, writes parts for them, mm-hmm. and like this movie, it's like better because Scotty J's in it, even it though the, the plot would not unravel without him. But he's mm-hmm. just he's he just so also good. Also provides for some very good comedic beats, like when he's is he putting yes. on the matching clothes. <laughs> and yeah. it doesn't fit him, you know. And like, I'm yeah. a I'm a fat guy, so like, I I know how that feels. But uh, uh, yeah. it, it was very funny because he yes. he just the oh, he looks so defeated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Hugo, I I interrupted you. Sorry, go ahead. So yeah, and and that makes him the fact that he's surrounded by actors by actors that are so good and are doing such in even interesting performances because like you know. Paul, the, Julianne Moore at times is completely unhinged in this film and she's great at that and she's just completely desperate and at the, sa- at the same time she's euphoric because she's doing so much coke um, right. and he he's the one who's, mo- who's very monotone he's like very playing it straight he's not doing a big performance and I think this film could have been better if he was either really really solid at doing a straight man uh, uh being the straight man in the film or if he was really over the top or not not over the top but very big you know powerful as the other performances are and and i'm imagining this film with you know a, a young brad pitt in it at his place in 1997 or somebody like that who would have cool. done something cool with this paul tom Sanson's first choice was leo dicaprio but yeah. dicaprio 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 turned this down and decided to do Titanic instead. So probably good, a good for decision him. Yeah. for uh, good for, for him. DiCaprio. But on the other <laughs> yeah. hand, if he had done this, you know, I mean, this oh, movie's yeah. already very well known and, and talked about. I can mm. only imagine that if Leo had done the, the role, it would be even more so. Yeah. Well, yeah. I I think this kind of launched Mark Wahlberg's career. Uh, I mean, he was in mm-hmm. Fear before it this. Did. He was in Basketball Diaries before this. But I feel like this launched him as as a leading man. Um, yeah. I, I, I guess I'm. I'm Maybe I'm being unfair about Warburg because I actually do think that I enjoy his performance in parts of this. Like I like, mm-hmm. I like like the the wide eyed, polite kid he plays. Like he's very like yes. soft spoken, very polite. Hey Jack, I was thinking about my name, like that kind of yeah. like inflection and tone. That's like, okay. Like that. that works for me yeah. a lot actually. But like the the like two 
emotional dramatic scenes he has one with his mom and one with burt reynolds a little off the midpoint yeah. neither of those work for me at all and like he's like almost like i won't say he's distracting but like he i don't know he i don't really buy him in those two yeah it strikes me as things. maybe he's like maybe mark and i don't know mark wolver personally obviously sure. but uh, yes. uh maybe he's just not a very emotional person in you know in his regular life mm-hmm. and then so in those scenes where he's called to act like he's crying he doesn't I, I I can't imagine Mark Wahlberg cries very often, you know, like, <laughs> and he has to be all, the, all uh, uh, has to show all these all these emotions that maybe he just really doesn't have. Sure, yeah, yeah, and I also feel like when he has to go emotional, he's struggling with his accent a bit more than in the other scenes because he ha- Mark Wahlberg has a strong you know Boston East Coast accent and. He when when he has to go big, you can tell it he, he, he feels like he's thinking about every word that he's saying mm. a little more than mm. in, in the regular scenes. But again, he's yeah, it is a bit of a problem with the film, and it's a reason why for me it's like let's say a four out four point five out of five instead of a five out of five. But mm. how many East Coast accents in Torrance? Big, yeah. Ed, yeah, Eddie Adams from Torrance. Yeah. Um, <laughs> last thing, I guess. I mean, I've already kind of alluded to this, but like. For me, this movie is, when I think about it, I usually think of the themes, which are like, you know, um, the American dream, rags to riches, sex, drugs, rock and roll kind of thing, a meteoric rise and a fall that follows it, um, the, you know, a changing world, 1970s and the 80s, and also like film to videotape that, that kind of theme, and also uh, finding family, like the family we choose kind of thing, um, you know. Uh, I think that... Amber waves Julian Moore as a mother is a little a little on the nose, it's a little in like on the, the nose. Finding, in the finding family theme of this, but that's kind of what I'm getting at is that this the themes are kind of right there on the surface. You don't really have to dig very deep to like see all those themes. They're all they're all pretty text and less subtext. I think um, I noticed this on the most recent watch is that when we in the in like the first ten minutes when we see Eddie like walk into his bedroom and like he looks at himself in the mirror in his underwear there's a pan around his room and shows all of his posters on his wall. And um, the posters are girls in bikinis, yeah. Bruce Lee, Bruce Corvettes Lee. and Serpico. And like all yeah. those, you know, Serpico is like Brock Landers, the character he plays Bruce Lee. He's really into karate. Uh, you know, Corvettes, he buys the Corvette. And one of the posters is literally a Corvette, the orange Corvette that he eventually buys. And it says American dream. And that's yeah. the whole poster is the words American dream and an orange Corvette. So, you know, it's, it's both like, priming you for what's to come but also like i don't know it, it's again you don't have to dig very deep to like get these things out of the movie and that's why i, I put in the outline that i think this movie's like a a film 101 starter kit where it's like a, it's a good like point of entry if you if you, at least it was for me maybe i'm extrapolating my own experience onto a, a bigger thing than I, I shouldn't do that but like if you're like looking to get into movies like there are worse you could watch than boogie nights because it's 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 got a lot to it a lot to pull apart the performances are good. The cinematography is good, you know, and, and like it, you don't have to dig very deep to like analyze it on like a thematic level. Like it's all kind of right there. Um, what, what do you guys, what, is, what do you think about that? I can see that I can, you know, it is a, a good entry point in terms of everything being surface level. It's probably not a great mm-hmm. entry point if you're just trying to get in into terms films, of content, in terms of content, uh, fourth graders bookmark this podcast. <laughs> Let's do it in 2027. <laughs> Are we positive that's the right year for them to like? Are they, is twenty twenty seven the right age? <laughs> Fourth graders will be sixteen in twenty twenty seven. Yes. Okay, but don't you have to be uh, seventeen for rated R movies? Uncle Josh says it's okay to watch <laughs> if you're age sixteen. Okay. <laughs> if you're if you're sixteen, you can watch this. It's fine. Okay. Yeah, well, fine. You know. you've seen if you're sixteen, you've seen worse than this. Yes, I'm sorry, but, but if uh, in terms of covering my butt, <laughs> don't don't watch bad stuff, kids. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, okay, I mean, so it is a good entry point in terms of, like you said, the, the, the everything is kind of surface level for the themes. Uh, and uh, honestly, there is some value in terms of like getting an education on films. There is some value to having the different levels of performance capability that you have in this film with Mark yeah, Wahlberg sure. delivering a very level average performance. And I, I will say it's an average performance. He, he wasn't bad. He didn't take away from the movie, but he didn't bring anything to it. And then you have just the fantastic performances of like Julianne Moore or uh, I, I, I honestly, I really like Don Cheadle. Uh, we haven't even yeah, really yeah, talked about absolutely. him. I was yeah. most interested in his character's arc 
out of all of the side characters because I just I wanted mm-hmm. him to I wanted him to win, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. He just loved it. <laughs> I love I love John C. Riley in this also. Oh, so funny. Um, He's always good. A- Apparently, apparently, Paul Thomas Anderson and John C. Riley are like buds, and that's why John C. Riley was in his first three movies. And mm-hmm. in the in the commentary track, Paul Thomas Anderson said, "I don't know if John C. Riley is good in this, and I kind of don't really care. I'm just like completely <laughs> blind because like he makes yeah. me laugh, and that's all that matters to me. I, I don't know <laughs> if he makes somebody else laugh, but he makes me laugh. And the the first scene at the pool party where he and Eddie meet, and he like makes him a margarita, and he asks him like, "What do you bench? What, what do you squat?" Stuff. <laughs> yeah exactly i, I um, asked you first <laughs> <laughs> yeah people think i look like han solo really yeah <laughs> yeah um according to the commentary track according to the commentary track that's just like john c riley and paul thomas anderson like a conversation they would have and he just like put it in the movie right. and like so I, I don't know i like that friendship makes me smile <laughs> in john c riley in this movie well, it's, great. it's great and it's safe to yeah. say like he is good so good work Paul Thomas He's Anderson. so good. You might have been and blind to it, but he was still good. <laughs> we're, we're, we're about to wrap up on Boogie Nights and talk about uh, Magnolia, but he's so good in Magnolia. I he's love so John C. Riley in Magnolia. Um, okay, sorry, but well, yeah, I'm going to have myself. Uh, Final thoughts with on Boogie your, Nights. I mean, yeah, with your point about it being a good like starter kit for, for getting into films, I, I think there's a, an interesting parallel between what you said and, and, and Paul Thomas Anderson as a director. It, it does feel like this is film 101 for him as well because he's so mature um in terms of filmmaking like the technical side of film like editing and cinematography and the types of shots he's trying to do and the types of performances he's looking for uh at the same time the the movies that follow this are a lot more uh complex in terms of themes they you have to dig deeper and 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 analyze and, and try to to extrapolate what the film is trying to say, while this one, as you said, the themes are sort of more upfront. So it does feel like even for him, this is a starting point. And then he'd get more and more complex, more and more even philosophical. In, yeah, in much his more intellectual films. in um, his later films. Yeah, more intellectual. Yeah, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. But it it's definitely you can see an evolution of his style and his ideas um, throughout his career that starts with this. So yeah, I, I think I completely agree. Point. I completely agree that like the barrier of entry for Boogie Nights is a lot lower than barrier of entry for like the master. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Holy crap. That's oh, yeah. a That's a big difference. Um, before we get to that, let's, let's rank this in our oh, oh, right. really dumb oh, thing that yes. I hate. Our film to you know, I wish ranking. you would be more positive about this experiment. I think it Listen, is, I think a, it is fun. <laughs> I'm a positive <laughs> guy. Stupid. I'm a positive guy. This sucks. Okay. <laughs> our, our film to remember ranking our film from a ranking so far, we have uh, from 1 to 11, Citizen Kane, The Thing, It's Wonderful Life, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Rudy, Mank, Jackie Brown, The Matrix Reloaded, Iron Man 3, The Sugarland Express, and Godfather Part 3 slash Coda, The Death of Michael Corleone. Where do you guys, uh, Hugo, where do you put um, Boogie Nights um, in that ranking? For me, I'm, it's definitely very high. Uh, I'm debating with myself whether it would be number one, two, or three, really, because I could see an argument for those spots. Um, That's what I like to hear. Yeah, so I think personally, just because I'm really into sci-fi, I I, I would kind of put the thing above it, but I, I would also kind of like this. I would rather watch this than Citizen Kane. So I would say maybe between those two, out of that reasoning, I would go number two, probably. Chris, I assume you're gonna be lower than that. Yeah, right and it, it's not gonna, you know, it's not gonna matter in the long run because you guys, are, you know, Josh thinks so highly of it. But <laughs> for <Yeah>. me, <laughs> I I would put it just below Jackie Brown. Okay, I see the the Tarantino entry from the same year, Jackie Brown or Boogie Nights. Yes. Interesting. Um, I'm looking at this list and I'm asking myself, Josh, are you really gonna rank Boogie Nights above It's a Wonderful Life? And uh, I know myself, and the answer is yes, I'm going to rank Boogie Nights yes. above <laughs> It's a Wonderful I Life. <laughs> I am I me. Yes. I can't well. change that. Um, so where are we with the thing? Uh, see, it's, it's not fair, because I just saw the thing for the first time for this podcast yeah. like, a few months yeah. ago. And Boogie mm-hmm. Nights is, as I said, a foundational text in my yeah. well, movie-loving life. If so. I could... Say something that that may may sway you, because like I said, I, I I would put it below Jackie Brown, but if it's going above, it's a Wonderful Life, and then we're deciding like where, I would I would use the barometer of which do I most want to watch again, 
And I would watch Boogie Nights again before I would watch The Thing. Or Citizen Kane, for that matter. <laughs> it, it sounds like Chris is like saying, oh, we could go number one if we can. I, I mean, if you guys <laughs> wanted to. I, I, I don't think it's a better made movie than, than most of those. Uh, Interesting. Um, I just thought about this. It's Citizen better than Kane some of the ones Boogie that we Nights, have above it. <laughs> they were both 26 years old when they made this. That's true. Yeah, that's true. The filmmakers were both 26. Um, I, I can't put this above Citizen Kane. I mean, I, I don't okay. know. Maybe, maybe I can, but I, I don't know if I should. Like if you I said, do, like, this I, would be as stupid as you say it is. <laughs> I've, I've kind of, I, I have kind of been like, I've been thinking of this list. I've said this before. I've been thinking of this list as like a recommendation list. Like, yeah. how strongly would Me I too. recommend it over one or the other? And like, I would, if you've seen neither The Thing nor Boogie Nights, I'm going to tell you to watch Boogie Nights personally before I tell you to watch The Thing. I'd agree with that. If, Probably. if you haven't seen either Boogie Nights or Citizen Kane, I would tell you to prioritize Citizen Kane, I think. So I'm going to yeah. put this, I'll put this at number two below Citizen Kane above The Thing, which I can't believe we cracked at number two. That's great. I mean, I love it because I love Boogie Nights, but you thought it would be, good. You thought it would be lower? Well, yeah, I mean, because yeah, he went and looked up what yeah. my rating was beforehand. <laughs> I didn't look it up. <laughs> TJ looked it up. Shout out to TJ again. I only, I only put it up this morning because I watched it this morning. So, <laughs> and you gave it? Yeah. Did you give it a four out of five? Out of, out I gave five? it four point five. Four point five. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, so a nine out of ten. You can stay in, then. In my Here's estimation. Your oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, shall we move on to? We're running really long on time. I apologize, but also, no, I don't. Question mark. Um, um, we could probably. We, we, we did our... talk a lot about uh, general Paul Thomas Anderson stuff as part of the Boogie mm-hmm. Nights discussion, so maybe we can, you know, advance yeah, we can a move on bit. to his filmography and then put some of that stuff in there. Sure. Okay. But you're running well, the show, Josh. Go for it. What do you, what do you want to do? I am running the show. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's, let's give a, a few general thoughts on Paul Thomas Anderson, just because I think it'll yes. help us. It helps us in our discussions that, that we don't have to, like, keep referring back to it. Um, mm-hmm. Things, number one I have on the outline here, I, I personally think Paul Thomas Anderson's movies should get as much fanfare and attention as, like, Quentin Tarantino's movies. And I don't think they do quite as much. Like, most Tarantino movies, you're, I feel like you're guaranteed a certain box office that you're definitely yeah. not guaranteed with Paul Thomas Anderson. And, I don't know, that sucks. I think they're, like, like I, I think I kind of prefer his movies to Tarantino's, but, mm-hmm. um, I don't know. And, like, the reason, I'm, the reason I'm grouping them in my mind is because they came up around the same time and I think Tarantino has said in interviews that like Paul Thomas Anderson is one of the few people that he considers like a peer because yeah. it came up around the same time and because like their careers have had similar trajectories. Like, you know, if you look back at the other people who are coming up around the same time as Tarantino, you have like Robert Robert Rodriguez and Kevin Smith and like all yeah. due respect to those guys, they have not had the career trajectory that Quentin Tarantino's had and yeah, no, Paul Thomas Anderson person. has had. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, what do you guys think about just his, his movies in general? Real quick. Yeah, I, I, by the way, I, I listened to that interview today. There's Tarantino talking about Paul Thomas Anderson and saying, oh, if you notice, very often our movies come out staggered. And right. I kind of, and he said, oh, for me, uh, I wanted to up my game after I saw There Will Be Blood. Mm. And after seeing There Will Be Blood, I, I made Inglorious Bastards and I put a lot more effort in trying to do something new and different from my own style with that film and reach the heights that I did because I felt this friendly competition with There Will Be Blood and, right. and you know, same thing with Phantom Thread and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And, mm. you know, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, I think, hosted uh, one of the premieres of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and did an interview with Tarantino. So, like, they're sort of close friends and, and friendly rivals. And, and, I, and there are also some similar elements to their films, I think, that make sense to group them together. Um, well, I think, but yeah, I think you certainly see, like, I think, quit, I think that there are parts of, of Paul Thomas Anderson's movies that are very Tarantino-esque, uh, yeah. particularly that scene in Boogie Nights, the, the coke scene that feels mm-hmm. lifted out of a Tarantino movie immediately. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, as far as Paul Thomas Anderson in general, I, I think he's great. I think he's one of the great American filmmakers that are working right now. Um, sometimes his movies uh, get too far up there in, inside their own head. For me, and I, 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 I sort of have yeah. a feeling of, yeah, but like, yeah, this is brilliant. This is so, this is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen, and the actors are all great. Uh, and then, but what exactly are we saying? What's the point? And why is this so long? Um, <laughs> but on the other hand, he's, he's, 
at least my favorite films from him are some of my favorite films. Like Magnolia, I watched this this week and I thought was was incredible. And I really want to watch it again soon, even though it's three hours long, because I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Uh, yep. There Will Be Blood, I think, is one of the modern ma- masterpieces, one of the best performances by an actor I've seen. Um, we'll get into the individual movies and say okay, those things. So, yeah. yeah, so uh, it, it, he's a little hit and miss in terms of my personal enjoyment. But I also think that all of his films are really, really, really well made. And yeah, he's one of the, the great directors right now. Grizz, I go. agree with you that he does not get the fanfare that he deserves and certainly doesn't get the fanfare that Tarantino does. I think mm-hmm. it's because Tarantino's movies have a lot more flash to them. Yeah. Uh, and certainly a lot more violence and, you know, across the board. Action. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and so I that makes that, them like... more appealing to a general audience uh, mm-hmm. than Paul Thomas Anderson's movies, which are as well made, if not better made than mm-hmm. Tarantino's. I think Paul Thomas Anderson's filmography has like evolved from Boogie Nights like this yeah. style and this kind of filmmaking and Tarantino's kind of like stayed in that lane. And like, there's nothing wrong with that. Cause that lane is really fun and exciting. But like, yeah. I feel like even Inglorious Bastards has more in common with Boogie Nights than like, you know, there will be blood does for example. Yeah. And I think, I think once upon a time in Hollywood is like one of the most distinct evolutions of Tarantino's filmography. Like once yeah. upon a time, time in Hollywood feels a bit like a Paul Thomas Anderson movie at times. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I agree with you, though, that, like, they are, like, Tarantino's movies are more exciting than Paul Thomas Anderson mm-hmm. movies, for, for example. Well, and I'll say, with they, Paul Thomas Anderson, I guess I, I, what I should say, with Quentin Tarantino, when I see a trailer for a movie, like, if it, even if I miss the part where it says at the top, from director Quentin Tarantino, because, like, that's how right. all the trailers always begin for him, if I miss mm-hmm. that, I would still see a movie and immediately be able to identify that it was Tarantino's movie. Uh, Agreed, yeah. With Paul Thomas Anderson, I I think that he has a little more flexibility in the movies that he makes. That I wouldn't necessarily know that a movie was Paul Thomas Anderson until you I was told. And when I was told, then it would be like, oh yeah, now I can see it. Here's all the things that are very Paul Thomas Anderson, like Phantom Thread, for instance. Uh, I would not if I didn't already know that it was Paul Thomas Anderson, I wouldn't have pegged that as a Paul Thomas Anderson movie. Uh, it's very different from the rest of his filmography in terms of the content and all that. Uh, like in terms of like the actual, yeah, like on the not the, the themes, the, the actual. Like, yeah. Yes, <laughs> it's not set in California. How about that? Well, I mean, it's not. Yeah, it's not set in California. <laughs> but uh, you know, once once you know that, you can see a lot of the shots. And I noticed this while I was watching Boogie Nights and uh, some of the other movies I watched of his this week, that you're like, oh, okay, there's that that sh- uh, silhouette shot from the side. He, he likes doing that. He actually does a lot of really like memorable scenes where the characters are in profile. And I know mm. that's not like the an only Paul Thomas Anderson thing, but I, it's something, the scenes that have stood out to me the most uh, over the last week were ones that were shot in profile. And you know, so now I, I start to see that in his other movies. Uh, and... I kind of forget where I was going, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think he's, that uh, he's got his own. He's got some things that are his style, but they are less obvious than things sure. that are Tarantino style. <laughs> I, I agree with that. I agree with that. So uh, I have on here some common things you see across. Uh, what are those common PTA stylings? Um, things you see across many of his movies. He sets movies in the San Fernando Valley a lot. The San Fernando yeah. Valley being like a, a part of Los Angeles, the northern part uh, where I currently live, for the record. Mm-hmm. Um, he said in his commentary for Boogie Nights that like he grew up in the valley and he was like ashamed of that growing up because he had these aspirations mm-hmm. of being this big director. And like, I don't know, the valley didn't get a whole lot of love in Hollywood. And so which is weird because because I grew, I grew up on Paul Thomas Anderson movies like I romanticized the valley because of the valley in Boogie Nights and Magnolia and Punch Drunk Love and so he's kind of like fixed the problem that he had growing up I guess which was the valley getting respect um he has a lot of ensemble casts uh particularly Boogie Nights and Magnolia being the two prime examples I think um and he has the same people in in multiple movies like I said John C Riley is in Heart 8 and Boogie Nights and Magnolia well, Laura Wal- Walters is in all three of those movies. Uh, Philip Baker Hall is in all three of those movies. Um, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Phil, Phil Hoffman's in all three of those movies and The Master. Pretty sure, I'm pretty sure he would have been in every... Yeah, I'm pretty sure he well, would have been in, there will in be all blood. of them. He was, he he was, was in there. Will oh, be. yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Um, but I'm pretty sure he would have cast him 
you know, in other movies that he would make. They if... they had a very special relationship, yes. Um, and yeah. I and actually in Soggy Bottom, the lead character in Soggy Bottom is played by Cooper Hoffman, who is the son of, of Oh, that, Hoffman. That's... So. Okay, it's really interesting. I, I'm I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, for you know hmm. a number of reasons. Uh, da, 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 da. Long, elaborate takes and meaningful camera movement. I guess you probably put that on the outline, Hugo. As I a did. I Paul did. Tom yes. Sanderson staple. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you've yeah, already, I, already I, talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. I also said involvement in the technical side of filmmaking. Yes. Meaning that he's very closely because some directors let the cinematographer do his own thing in some ways he's very involved and he's very specific apparently according to interviews and stuff about the type of lighting that he wants the type of shot that he wants uh, the elaborate you know long take that he does and he's even credited as as cinematographer in 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 several of the in phantom thread yeah uh um, yes and no actually so robert ellswit is his longtime cinematographer robert yeah. ellswit shot every movie from uh heart eight in 1986 through the mask. No, uh, there will be blood in two thousand seven. Mm-hmm. So he shot Heart Eight and Boogie Nights and Magnolia and Punch of Glove and the Ma- and uh, there will be blood. But um, he moved away to a different cinematographer for the master, whose name I cannot pronounce. So I'm not going to try. Mm. And then for Phantom Thread, he didn't have. There's no, there's actually no credited cinematographer. On there's no Phantom credit. Thread, yeah, but because. <laughs> but you're right that he actually did shoot a lot of that himself. Yeah. And then, but then he also like. Uh, different grips he's worked with over the years also shot portions of that movie. So instead of like dividing up the credit between three people, or mm-hmm. instead of he just didn't the credit put a himself, credit they just did. There is no, there's no credited cinematographer on Phantom Thread. But you're right that he did like shoot a yeah. lot of that movie himself. And also, um, you know, it just means he's really involved with that stuff. You know. Yes. Um, it. Yeah. We we have a lot of other things on our list of like different uh, Paul Thomas Anderson hallmarks, but the one that I just want to shout out is that he a lot of his movies are about like lonely people or broken mm-hmm. people or people that are isolated that yep. find their people you know that kind of thing you kind of see that over and over again so like I, I really want to hit that point because as we talk about each individual movie in his filmography i'm going to mention that it's about a broken person and that's just like kind of just like a blind thing yeah. for paul tom sanderson's movies it's about about broken people um so i guess heart eight was his first movie it came out in 1996 um small movie Small scale, small setting, small budget. Um, have you guys seen Heart Eight? Nope. nope that's seen the Heart one 8? that I haven't seen. No. Sure. Um, I saw it many years ago, like I don't know, eight or something years ago. I don't remember a ton from it, but I remember thinking it was good, like yeah. and liking it. Um, it was adapted from a short film by Anderson, much like Book of Nights was. And you see a lot of future collaborators in this movie. Like I said, John C. Riley, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Philip Baker Hall, Melora Walters. Um, John Bryan did the music, and he would do music for his movies going forward until Johnny Greenwood. And uh, Robert Ellswood shot it, and he would shoot his movies going forward until The Master. Um, but I think the the main footnote of Hard Eight is that uh, he had Paul Thomas Anderson had some. Uh, he kind of butted heads with the studio in the edit. Uh, I think the edit mm-hmm. was like kind of taken from him by the studio. Uh, for example, like h- h- the original movie was titled Sydney, which is the name of the main character played by Phil Baker Hall. And then, but it was released called Heart Eight, and like I think that's like, you know, part of yeah, this one is of like the changes, yeah, uh, uh, you know, that's a leftover from the struggle between him and the studio of like the name of the movie even, and like in the commentary track, whenever he refers to it, he usually refers to it as Sydney, and then like a few times mm-hmm. he corrects himself and says, oh wait, actually it's called Heart Eight, whatever. Um, <laughs> but I mentioned that because you know him having that clash with the studio kind of, I think affected him moving forward and made him a little more uncom- uncompromising in his artistic vision. Uh, that's why like. With Boogie Nights, he insisted up front it has to be NC-17 and three hours long, and I won't concede on either one of those points. And he ended up conceding on both of them, but like that's kind of like where he was in the headspace there to make those demands because he had such a negative experience in in releasing Heart Eight. Uh, good movie, I recommend it, but not a not a ton for me to say about it. It's about like a, a hitman who takes John C. Riley under his under his wing, and there's like gambling. It's in Reno, blah 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 blah, but. Um, Samuel L. Jackson's here, kind of doing like a dry run for Jackie Brown. He plays a very Ordell Ro- Robbie kind of character, but sold. Um, yeah, Heart Eight's good, solid. Check it out. Yeah. Um, but uh, so Heart Eight, nineteen ninety six, Boogie Nights, nineteen ninety seven. Boogie Nights is a, a a hit, relatively speaking. It's a critical darling. It gets some Academy Award nominations. So expectations were large for whatever he was going to do next after Boogie Nights. Mm-hmm. And what he did next was a movie called Magnolia released in 1999 and um wow like 
what can you really say about Magnolia? Uh, if, if you haven't seen Magnolia, please watch Magnolia. Um, Hugo, you're smiling. You watched it for the first time this week, right? I watched it this week, and I wasn't. I, I went in kind of dreading it a little bit because mm-hmm. it is. It's three hours and ten minutes long, mm-hmm. and um, as much as I love some of the other movies that he made, like particularly Devil Be Blood, is is was my favorite before I watched Magnolia. And now Magnolia is my favorite. Um, yes, they they do have a sense of uh, sort of emotional detachment. A lot of the time, you're not his necessarily. Movies, yeah. You're not necessarily directly involved in the emotion that they're not. Their movies, you know how how we say Spielberg in some ways tells you how to feel. Uh, Paul Thomas Anderson is more in the business of showing you a situation and letting you draw your own conclusions. And Magnolia is not like that at all. Magnolia is is a very emotional movie. It's all about human connection. It's all about um, oh, these are all people who are completely broken, but. But there, there can be a silver lining. It's and it's about filled with melancholy. Uh, the music is brilliant. Uh, some of the performances are completely over the top and crazy and fun to watch. Yes. Um, and, and I had a yes. Yeah, more respect. <laughs> that, that's uh, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. There's there's two c words that I'm not going to say. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Tom Cruise. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, well, but, hold on. Yeah. Before I let you go any further, I guess I should I should recap what this movie is in case anyone hasn't seen it. Yeah. Um. And it's just like, it's actually kind of hard to recap what it is, but I'll do my best. It's it's three hours long and it covers like nine different characters who are all mm-hmm. kind of living separate lives in the San Fernando Valley, and it's just their their lives intersect over the course of one day. I think it's this like a, day, over and a half. day, day and a half. It's like a day and, and a half. Um, John C. Riley is a cop who's looking for love. And yeah. uh, Jason Robards is a dying man, dying of cancer. And like yeah. Phil Hoffman is his in-house hospice nurse. Yeah. And uh, Julianne Moore is his cheating wife, wife who's addicted yeah. to all kinds of pills. And he is estranged from his son, who's played by Tom Cruise, who runs these like seminars yeah. for like pickup artists. That's like yeah, hard to manners. watch, but also like it's probably some of the best uses of Tom Cruise's powers ever put to film, yes. like his charmingness. It's um, a- great use of him yes a, and there's also um philip baker hall is like this game show host who's show also host. dying and he is uh estranged from his daughter melora walters who's also addicted to drugs and there's a quiz kid who's like on that show that like has a, a strange relationship with his father michael bowen and then uh william h macy is here as a former quiz kid uh there's there's a lot going on and um yeah it's all really good and it feels yeah it sounds overwhelming but it isn't because no. the whole this stories intersect thematically so well, and the editing in this film is so good. Every scene, even though they're telling separate stories of separate characters, each scene builds on top of the previous scene so well, and it, it's so impressive. It reminds me of movies like Cloud Atlas, uh, which are telling very different stories, but the editing is so good that the story works. And I don't. Yes. Know, I've, I've been watching the series. Again, by the Wachowskis, um, uh, Sensate. And I don't know if you've seen it, but if you've seen, if you watch Sensate, you can tell the Wachowskis absolutely adore this film because there's just some elements that are uncanny. Right. Um, it breaks but, the fourth wall. It, it does a bunch of cool stuff, and it, it just I think it's amazing. Really weird ending. Right. Uh, really weird. I love ending, the ending. But well, okay. Yeah, so, I think it's great. Again, like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a it's a sprawling ensemble piece uh, about fathers and their children and about loneliness yeah. and about um, but it's also about coincidence. Um, mm-hmm. It is it is like nine characters and their lives intersecting and like coincidence is a part of that. And mm-hmm. one of my favorite parts of this movie is the like five minute prologue. If you haven't seen Magnolia, yes. But if if you haven't seen Magnolia and you're listening to this, please just like go to Google and type in Magnolia opening scene and watch that. And I'm willing to bet you'll want to watch the next two hours and 55 minutes because the opening yeah. scene is an all-timer for me. It mm-hmm. kind of has nothing to do with the story itself. It's, like I said, a prologue about coincidence and fate to an, to an extent. Mm-hmm. And it's so, so good. But one thing I want to say about the prologue, about the ending, Grizz, is there's reference to Exodus uh, chapter, two, uh, chapter 8, verse 2. Yes. Um, there's little Easter eggs throughout the movie that say Exodus 8-2, including the opening scene and elsewhere in the movie. And the what the hell is going on moment from the third act is 
kind of in Exodus 8 to, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. if you read the Bible. And it is, it is a biblical thing that happens in the yeah. back half hour of this movie. It's and weird. It, <laughs> raises some it raises some eyebrows for sure but um yeah. i mean I, I guess that gets the larger point which is this movie is a complete mess but it's a mess in a great way for me it yeah. it, it works so well even like honestly um first of all paul thomas anderson has said that like he, he was like 28 29 when he made this clearly he's a guy feeling a lot of fe- feelings and he puts all of those feelings into this movie it is like you said hugo it's unapologetically emotional it, it wears its heart on its sleeve and there's a lot here. It's north of three hours long. He said in recent years that if, if he were to make this today, he would cut at least 20 minutes from it. Because, yeah. you know, it is, it's a little indulgent at times. But, like, mm-hmm. he, he already cut so much of it that, like, some of it, like, doesn't make sense. Like, the, the plot with um, John C. Riley as the cop, like, finding a body and then, like, losing his gun in the yeah, rain it, at it one point. It just doesn't like, really go anywhere. Right. There was more to that in the original mm-hmm. movie. Like, um, Orlando Jones... Uh, what was in the movie as the worm, the guy that like John C. Riley's after, but like he, all of his scenes were cut. And so like that kind of storyline mm-hmm. doesn't really like, it's not really resolved. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So like, uh, again, like, so the movie is a mess, like it's a complete mess, but like, I, I love it. And it, Me too. the like unabashed emotionalness, like works for a lot of people. Like this is a special movie for a lot of people, including myself. If it doesn't work for mm-hmm. you, I don't blame you, but it it's really, good. really works for me. And it sounds like it works for Hugo too. Yeah, it, it, it is a it's it a good movie. I uh, easily on the level of Boogie Nights for me. Yes, and uh, as I said, an, an all time Tom Cru- all time Tom Cruise performance. He's he's so good in this. Um, if a little hard to watch he's, at times. He's yeah. painful to watch, but at the yes. same time, it's so funny. The way they shoot it, the mm-hmm. way they shoot it, and the music they use, it's uh, yeah. it's hilarious. It's so funny. So I think that's yeah. a good that's a good transition to our next one. I think that Magnolia harnesses Tom Cruise's considerable abilities better than most Tom Cruise movies, and I think mm-hmm. Paul Thomas Anderson's next movie, Punch Drunk Love, also harnesses the abilities of its lead actor better than any other movie that he's ever done, and that's Adam Sandler as the center of Punch Drunk yeah. Love. Um, so after Boogie Nights was two hours thirty five minutes, Magnolia was three hours and nine minutes. Paul Thomas Anderson promised that his next movie would be. 90 minutes long, and it would be a romantic comedy. And that's exactly what he made with uh, Punch Drunk Love. Um, still set in the San Fernando Valley, so it's third straight movie set in the Valley. And um, mm-hmm. it's third straight movie with Philip Seymour Hoffman and Louise Guzman, shot by Robert Ellswit. And um, yeah, Adam Sandler's at the center of this movie. And I think that this movie, more than, maybe more than any other, like, takes what he's good at and lets him do exactly that. Um, I, like I, yeah. I personally have nothing against Adam Sandler. Like Happy Gilmore is like unironically one of my favorite movies of all time. I, 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 I write for that. But like the the way that this movie harnesses his like awkward sweetness and his repressed simmering rage is remarkable. Yeah, yeah. And it it really really works for me. And I I absolutely adore this movie. I, I, Hugo, you said it was like cringy for you. What do you think? No, uh, yeah, cringy, but not in a bad way. Like sure. uh, me and my girlfriend yesterday night and. Both of us get really bad secondhand awkwardness. Yeah. Uh, so this film is r- really awkward. Like the characters are really awkward. They're put in really awkward situations, and they do awkward stuff. It's like it's like but, stylized. It's like stylized to be more awkward. It's like it's, like, it's almost like yeah. The, the things that happen like kind of don't make sense all the time, and the things people say don't make sense mm-hmm. all the time. But it's almost as if like you're in Adam Sandler's head and experiencing the world the way he experiences it, and because he's like exactly. a ball of anxiety who is very socially uncomfortable, like the movie is that mm-hmm. also, you know? It, it really makes you feel that. And I, and I think at that, it's excellent because it, it, it really puts you in his head in many ways. And, and, and the score is so good at that John as well because the so score good. is so, ah, oh, it's so stressful. Like it, I could, there were moments where I was physically uncomfortable because of the score and I wanted it to stop and then it stops. Yeah. And, as, as much as it made me feel uncomfortable, I think it's brilliant because it's trying to make me feel uncomfortable. Yes. So yeah, uh, I thought Grace. it was really good. Not, not one of my favorite just because I wouldn't watch it again as an enjoyable experience, but it, it, it's great at what it does. So uh, you say that this, this movie takes advantage of Adam Sandler in a way that no other movie has, and I disagree. 
because Uncut Gems took advantage of Adam Sandler in the exact same way. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I was in no, because Howard so Ratner, sweet. Howard Ratner anyway. is not sweet at all. He's not an endearing guy, and like I, I really didn't. Barry think that... Egan, Barry Egan is. I don't think he's you know? that sweet. You don't think Barry Egan is sweet? No, I think he's always a, a half a beat away from flying off the handle and killing everyone in the room. Like <laughs> Barry Egan, Barry Egan, the character that Adam Sandler plays in Punch Drunk Love, just he wants to be loved. He's lonely. Yes. He yeah. Is uh, he? He feels like no one understands him. He he like. He he pulls his his brother in law, who's a dentist. He pulls him aside and says, um, "You're a doctor. Can you help me? I just feel like crying all the time, <laughs> yeah. and uh, I don't know if I'm normal." Sometimes I don't, I don't like know. myself. I don't like myself. Yeah, he's and, like, unwell, and uh, right. Well, and just the way he yeah. says, um, he says, "I don't know what's normal because I don't know how other people are. So I don't know if like me crying all yeah. the time is normal or not. Like that's really sweet to me, and okay. you do not see that in Howard Radner at all." Okay, I mean I, I'll agree with that, but in terms of uh, taking advantage of Adam Sandler's simmering rage, at the very least. Yeah. Uncut gems. Simmering rage. Simmering rage is only half of it, though. It's it's the sweetness and the rage. But yeah, I okay. agree with you. Uncut but uh, but when I was watching the also, movie, yeah, and this is frenetic the, nature as well. This is the first time I had watched this this movie as well. Uh, it was earlier this week, and I, I I couldn't decide if it was just residual anxiety from having watched Uncut Gems. That was making me <laughs> so uncomfortable with Adam Sandler all the no, time. <laughs> there, but there's a lot of there's a lot of discomfort in in Punch Drunk Love as well. But it's yeah. a different kind of discomfort. I yeah. think uh, I, I felt bad for Barry, like basically yeah. the entire movie. Mm-hmm. I just I feel so yeah. bad for him because like his family his family yeah. does not help him, and right. and they no. they honestly they make things worse. So it's no no wonder that he ends up the way he is because his family is abusive. <laughs> yes, uh, but. I think the the discomfort was was intentional and it was well achieved, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, you you end up rooting for him. And I think that's one of the nice things about this movie versus a lot of oh, I shouldn't say a lot of about half of Paul Thomas Anderson's other movies is that the main character in this one you actually do want him to succeed because he's you know you the things that are wrong with him you can see are not his fault. Right. And so you can pull mm-hmm. for him. Whereas in a lot of the other movies, the main characters, they put themselves in terrible situations. And, yes. uh, and so you're less likely to want to root for them because like, no, you, you kind of did this to yourself, but you don't get that Agreed. with Barry. And, uh, and so I, I, I thought punch drunk love again, the same level of quality for me as boogie nights or, uh, or Magnolia. I, I, I really enjoy it. I, I thought it was fun to see a take on romantic comedy from Paul Thomas Anderson. Yeah. So earlier, Hugo mentioned that Paul Thomas Anderson's movies get more complex uh, later in his, his career. And I think that this might be, at least for me, it was the first movie that it really helped watching it a second time. Like Magnolia mm-hmm. and Boogie Nights and There Will Be Blood as well. I think when you watch those three, like what they're doing is immediately obvious and why they're so good is immediately obvious. But some of his other movies like took me a couple of viewings to like, like, Punch Rock Love is very offbeat. Like, very, very offbeat. And I very. think that, that can kind of, like, you latch onto that on your first viewing, and so you kind of miss, like, at least for me, like, I latched onto that on my first viewing that I missed how sweet this movie is. And it wasn't until second or third mm-hmm. viewing that I, like, realized, first of all, this movie's hysterical, and second of all, it's extremely mm-hmm. sweet and endearing, at least for me. Like, it, it really, really works as a romantic comedy for me. I think it's really tender, but, like, I didn't, like, kind of get that on first viewing. And I kind of will mention that with his later stuff that like it took me a viewing to like kind of get what the movie was and then a second viewing to see what actually is this. And I think um, in terms of the genre of romantic comedies, Punch Drunk Love is truly unique. Uh, so if you, I completely agree. Yeah, if yeah. you are not a fan of rom-coms, you can still give uh, Punch Drunk Love a shot because it's not prototypical at all. Yes. No. And uh, an all-time Phil Hoffman. Uh, he's barely in this, but the the season he's in this is uh, is shut all-time up. for me. Shut, <laughs> shut <laughs> up! Shut! 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 <laughs> Are you threatening me, Dick? Okay, uh, that's it for uh, for Punch Drunk Club. So after Punch Drunk Club, that's six. That's six. Sorry. <laughs> that's true. Um, after Punch Drunk Club, synonyms Love, still count. He Paul Thomas Anderson takes five years off and comes out with uh, a little movie called There Will Be Blood. Ever heard of it? Um, originally in the outline, I 
broke down each of his movies and had like little thoughts, little bullets under each one. And I didn't have anything under There Will Be Blood originally. So like, wh- what are we going to say about There Will Be Blood right now that, I mean, hasn't already been said? I mean, it's uh, largely thought to be one of the best movies made this century, one of the best American movies yeah. ever made. Um, yeah. In- instant classic, I think, is a, a term that comes to mind. Uh, instant masterpiece is another term that comes to mind. Um, this This came out fall of my senior year of high school so i was like turning 18 as this came out and i was taking my first film class when this came out and i remember seeing this in a the theater and just like it blew my hair back it felt like i'd just been struck by lightning um mm-hmm. i don't and it's only grown in my estimation in the year since then uh I, I don't know like hugo you mentioned earlier down day lewis in this this is maybe one of the best performances i've ever seen in a movie personally um yeah Granted, I saw it at, sure. a pretty, at a pretty impressionable age that, like, you know, I was kind of, like, discovering the great performances of all time. And this, like, was up there. You know, I, I watched this and, like, On the Waterfront and Raging Bull all within a few months of each other. And, like, yeah, this, this holds up against those. So maybe this is, like, the best acting I've ever seen. That's a, a yeah. good possibility. If you, if you had to if – you, if you put a gun to my head and, and said I had to pick the best actor of all time – Daniel Day Lewis would probably be the first name that springs to mind. Yeah, it may not yeah. be correct, but he would definitely be the first one I think of. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I uh, I can't take my eyes off him in this movie. Um, and like, I've watched this movie a lot. Uh, I mentioned Boogie Nights is like a, a, a foundational text for me. There will be blood is more of a core text, I think. And I've hmm. I've studied every frame of this movie. I've seen it so many times. And I, I still, like, am in awe of all the little decisions Dan Day-Lewis is making. Um, and he, he's in every frame of this movie, too. And it's two and a half hours long. And he's always interesting. Um, what he does with his voice, uh, the pauses he takes, what he does with his eyes. His physicality. Um, his physicality. And, like, yeah, like, the, the baptism scene is, like, you know, the big shouty Oscar clip that everyone always, like, thinks about in this movie. But, like, even... the, the I- Oh, right. Sorry, you, right. you, you like, topped out there, Hugo. We didn't but get I believe you abandoned your child <laughs> is uh, what you said. But like even the smaller moments, like I'm thinking about when he like first walks into Eli's church and like just the hatred in his eyes as he looks around yeah. the congregation. Yeah. Um, when his first scene where he gives like that spiel to the people, the I, people of that small town. That's my favorite. This is my son of my padre, W. Plain B. Like th- just that speech is so good, and like you run a family business. I'm a family. I, I make my payments, and I'm going to yes. start drilling as soon as I, he's. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the quiet I mean, moments are my favorite. We, well. we could we could just, gush about right. we could gush about Dan Day Lewis and and there would blood all day, but let's try to. But it's not just that. It's not just that. Like that. Yeah, um, the cinematography is also some of the best I've ever seen. Incredible. The way it uses landscapes in the you know the American frontier. Uh, Robert Ellswit finally won an Oscar for this movie. Um, yeah, this is his, this his is long time cinematography. Sneakily, one of the best westerns ever made. Uh, yeah, even though and, there's no gunslinging and, and, and all yeah. that. But it, this know. this this same year, Roger Deakins shot a movie called The Assassination of Jesse James by the Tower of Robert yeah. Ford, which is cited by many people, including myself, as some of the best cinematography of any movie of all time. And it lost yeah. the best cinematography Oscar to this movie. To this movie, and yeah. I'm like, and I'm not really that mad about it. <laughs> That's how good <laughs> the cinematography is. It's me, and also uh, this is the first time. He worked with Johnny Greenwood writing his scores. He, you know, John Bryan, and, great job in the first four movies, but let Johnny Greenwood step in. And this is one of the best movie scores uh, <laughs> for is. me ever. I have it on vinyl. Um, and, yeah. As I said, if I had to pick, gun to my head, best actor, I would say Daniel Day Lewis. If yes. I had to pick the most underrated and overlooked actor, Paul Dano is yeah. F- yeah. phenomenal. And like, yes. not just in this yeah. movie, and basically most movies I've seen him in, I'm just every time I'm just surprised mm-hmm. at how good Paul Dano is. And yet you never Shout out to prisoners. People don't talk about him. <laughs> he's yeah. so good. Yeah. And he goes he goes yeah, he's gonna... toe in this movie with, with Dan Day Lewis, um, and comes out looking great, which is unbelievable. Holds his own. He... Holds his own. You should also um, watch yeah, Swiss this... Army Man if you get a chance. That movie's great, yeah. It's so big good. Fan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so this, yeah, for... this movie, well, I, I may have more of an emotional reaction to Magnolia, so I, I think Magnolia is my favorite, but in terms of just his most perfectly made film, this is up there, because it, it it's impeccable. There's nothing about this that I could say, oh, this is a flaw. Yeah. Um, 
it's Kubrickian in many ways. It, yes. it feels that way. There's that conclusion that is so unsettling and it yes. just cuts to black after something really unsettling happens. And yes. you're just left with this feeling of heaviness, but at the same time, you feel like you've experienced something. Um, it, and it puts you into this character's mindset for the whole film. But at the same time, it, it, it portrays, you know, the, the good and the bad of him. And, and you hate him, but you can't look away from him. It's, it, yeah, it's incredible. And I love the score. I love the score for yeah. this and I love the score for the next movies. I think Johnny Greenwood yeah. is incredible because he, he uses classical instruments to make really avant-garde and weird scores that don't, don't really fit uh, the time I, I added this uh, on the ta- on on our uh, timetable for the podcast uh, outline. Sorry, um, that his movie Paul Thomas Anderson movies often have sort of uh, um, soundtracks, so actual music, pop music that fits uh, the period where the film is set. But often they have really weird avant-garde scores that don't fit the period at all. So, but that are so good at setting a mood. And and yeah. this film and the next ones. With Johnny Greenwood, he has these really weird sounds that that you don't you can't even really tell what they're being made with, but they put you in a mood and they build tension and and even a simple scene where nothing is really happening has so much tension in it because of the score and how great it is. So yeah, cinematography again, you said it. It's 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 yeah, great. it's perfect. And and you know we're talking about kind of the the aesthetics of there will be blood and the acting and the cinematography and the music, but like the, the content of the story is also it's a, good um, story. A, a lot to dig into. And like I said, you know, you could write a paper on boogie nights and like the themes are kind of right there for you. You could write more than a paper on there with blood. Um, just uh, ambition, power. And like, it's, it's a frontier story. So like you can kind of extrapolate a lot of things that like, Daniel Day Lewis's character, Daniel Plainview, and Paul Dono's character, Eli, are kind of like kind of fighting for the soul of America. Yeah. Just the fact that like America is blossoming before our eyes in this little town. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, but they're both swindlers. The businessman is swindling this small town. The preacher is also swindling the small town. So like, what does that say about the both. people who Yeah, exactly. There, there there's a lot to dig into and a lot to to pull apart, um, outside of just the considerable aesthetics, which like I said is you know, all time cinematography, music, acting, etc. Um, yeah, to and... me, this film is is about um, the American dream, but in in both a positive and a negative light, because it shows you how it can be so uh, it can lead to so much innovation and so much creativity, but at the same time, it can be self destructive in many ways, and and yeah. it's a critique of you know fanaticism and rugged, complete individualism, like he you know the big scene is i abandoned my child but yeah it is a theme of the film that the child is abandoned and he's he ends up in you know this i'm not going to spoil it but like if if, know, if paul he, he's so movie, successful but at the same time he doesn't really have anything in his life if paul thomas anderson's previous movies had the theme of finding family there will be blood is yeah. a serious perversion of the finding family aspect that was a part of his, mm-hmm. his previous movies uh in, in a number of ways both with uh, Daniel Plainview's son and his brother that he finds halfway through the movie. Um, but that, that's a good segue in that his, his previous movies, you know, Punch Out Glove, Magnolia, Boogie Nights, they were all pretty hopeful about people, broken people, but like it was, it still felt, you know, good things for these people. There Will Be Blood is pretty misanthropic, like, really is, like yeah. jarringly misanthropic. And that's a good segue into his next movie, which is The Master from 2012, which mm. I think is also fairly misanthropic um the master is uh we haven't really been talking about like what the, these movies are but the master is you know philip sumer hoffman runs a religion slash cult, cult possibly cult. um yeah. <laughs> i mean yeah but like when this movie yeah, came yeah. out the, the big talking point about it was that it's like like l ron hub l ron hubbard and scientology and like it is and it isn't like that i think that's a bit of a reductive reading of the master but that's you know mm. if you go go you can see those parallels yeah, you, you could do a lot worse in terms of like what the, what explaining what this movie is to someone than saying it's not unlike Scientology, but it's also more than that. And really, it's um, Joaquin Phoenix plays Freddie Quell, who is a World War II veteran in the fifties, who's kind of aimless and uh, also like a psychopath and a dangerous, 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 dangerous unhinged person. man. And he stumbles upon he's a lost soul, as is the case for a lot of Paul Thomas Anderson characters, and he stumbles upon this 
this man, Phil Hoffman, uh, Lancaster Dodd is his character, and he gives Freddie Quell like a purpose, I guess, and you know something to believe in, which is him, Lancaster Dodd, basically. And yeah. uh, again, two just really shitty dudes. Uh, this movie is full of like really people that I kind of hate and can't stand to be around. Yeah. So it's it's uh, yep. it's a tough sit for me. Um, my take on the master is that it's it is. incredible acting. Both a- all Amy Adams, Phil Hoffman, and Joaquin Phoenix were all nominated for Oscars. Uh, I think the writing is good in like a scene. Said. The writing's good in like a scene to scene kind of sense. Like there's a lot of great scenes in the master. Um, and again, the acting is great in those scenes. The writing is great think, in those scenes. But I like think the, the the writing is great in terms of dialogue. I don't yeah. think it's great in terms of story because I and I think. Paul Thomas Anderson himself says this film is light on story, heavy on character. And that's Mm. fair. But at the same time, if you're going to make me sit through what is a long film, and this is true for this and Inherent Vice, which is the next one that we're going to talk about, it's like two, two and a half, two, two, two hours, 20 minutes, two and a half hours. And like this part, I don't get where we're going. (laughs) Yeah. So (laughs) that's a good point, Josh. Uh, Well, we said, (laughs) we we said we were going to monologue. Um, But yeah, I, I do feel like, the individual scenes are really good, really relaxing, really in shot. When you put it all together, I don't know where we're going. Are we talk, we're talking yeah. about fanaticism. We're talking about uh, broken people and how they can be sort of um, kind of adopt, be adopted by Finding cultish family. behavior. Yeah, fine, but it, this is not just family. It's like a cultish type of behavior and how a, a charismatic leader can can take broken people who don't know what to do with themselves and bring them under their wings into something that isn't necessarily a good thing. It's um, an interesting companion piece that there will be blood in that sense. It is, but at the same time, it it could have been an hour and 30 minutes and done the same thing. Yeah, I, I, mean, I don't get... A lot of the scene is just building and building on top of each other, but it, it's they're all saying the same thing. And at some point, it's just, it is a bit, I don't know... It gets a bit boring. To be what you're what you're saying is kind of what I'm saying is that I think that the whole is less than the sum of its parts. Like it has good parts, yeah. but I don't I don't really get what the purpose of the whole thing is. And that's kind of it. Kind of yeah. leaves me like I, I've tried with this movie because I know that a lot of people like it, and I like a lot of people movie. just think it's his best. Yeah, yeah, and and I love every movie he made before this. So like I and like I said earlier, there are you know some of his movies I need to see multiple times. I have seen this multiple times, and like I've I've tried and i watched it most recently earlier you know early last year uh early in quarantine and i just i can't see what it is in this movie that people are responding to because i'm not really responding to much yeah my my uh, whole thing with this yeah. movie is just that like as great as all the performances are and they are fantastic you know excellent mm-hmm. performances really fascinating characters but by the end of the movie i felt like nothing had changed for any of them uh, every, yeah. you know, and so it, I was kind of left like, what's the point? And maybe that's yeah. the point. Yeah. Was yeah. <laughs> but, but uh, it didn't resonate with me. But did I have to sit through all of this? To right. Get there? Exactly. It, you know, yeah. it, no, it's still beautifully the... shot and directed as you'd expect. Uh, but it's just not. There, it's it, a tough sit. You know, it doesn't add anything uh, at the end of the experience yeah. to me. Yeah, this this I, I chalk this up to being one that uh, I appreciate, but I don't particularly like it. Like I, I like yeah. you said, I, I appreciate the aesthetic, I appreciate the acting, and I appreciate the role in spots, but like I, I don't know, I I don't like. I'm not seeking out this movie very much. I'm not reaching for it. Like I want to like it, but I just kind of can't. It's it's frustrating more than than anything else. And uh, speaking of frustrating, his next movie is Inherent Vice in 2014, <laughs> which is. I would say it's equally frustrating to the master for me in that, like, I kind of don't really, I, I like individual scenes, but I don't really get like, you know, maybe the whole is less than some of its parts for me at least, but I at least like enjoy watching this movie and I don't really enjoy watching the master. Like they're like the master's like kind of actively off putting and inherent vice is at least charming and funny and offbeat. It's also just like, I, I feel like I'm having a stroke when I'm watching it because so much is happening and I, I can't. I can't get my. I can't wrap my head around any of it. And that that is the point. I, I haven't think. seen like, it. <laughs> okay, that that's cool. Uh, so I think uh, Matthew Sol- Solar Zeitz, who who writes for um, RogerReaper dot com, among other sites, he's he's a great writer. Uh, he said that it's a a stoned movie. 
about a stone character and like you kind of feel stone watching yeah. it because like just things are rushing past you and like it you can't wrap your head around like the bigger picture and maybe there isn't really a bigger picture to wrap your head around but it is it's frustrating but like intentionally so but at least like the journey of the journey is at least fun like if you kind of just like let it wash over you it, it's adapted from a thomas pinchon novel i haven't read it but apparently like a lot of his books are kind of that vibe where like there's a lot thrown at you and you can't really wrap your head around it but that's okay because the journey's fun um and it stars walking phoenix as a private detective in the 1970s in in la and he again is stoned all the time and like does stuff and, and he does meets stuff, people and meets people and they he investigates him. something they hire him to doesn't find matter people. and doesn't get a resolution and while while he's investigating this first missing person he's hired to find a second missing person and you're like wait what about that first person and then there's a dead body that shows up and like i don't know i i, I feel like I, I feel crazy even trying to recap it um i i, I rewatched this this week but I, like i kind of only half watched it while i was doing other stuff and mm. uh I think I got about as much out of it half watching it as I did when I saw it in the theater and gave my full attention to it. Um, I guess that's a criticism, but I don't really know. I also know that a lot of people like the master really, really like this movie um, and think it's a masterpiece. I enjoy it. Yeah. For me, I don't really get it though. For me, like I kind of just chalk it up to that. Yeah. For me, it's, it's my least favorite uh, PTA movie. Um, I, I told this to uh, Josh before, but my take on it is the, is, is it's kind of like the Big Lebowski without all of the fun. So, I yeah, the plot doesn't matter, but it doesn't matter also in the Big Lebowski. And uh, the overall mystery kind of gets a resolution. Some some of it, some of it doesn't. But you know, I I don't need a plot to be always a hundred percent complete. I don't need the mystery to be solved, but if the journey is fun and I care about the characters and, and I kind of didn't in this one, I couldn't name anyone. I think he's called doc. And I, doc. That, it's so simple. Chester, I remember, yeah, I remember it. Yeah. yeah. I remember it because it's so simple, but having seen it, I, I couldn't tell you exactly what happens in this film. I couldn't yeah. tell once I had seen it. And, you know, again, two and a half hours long, if this was an hour and 40 minutes and it was like just, kind of a fever dream of him being really high all the time and going through these cases, I might have liked it. Yeah. Um, but it goes on for so long and none of what happens really matters at all. There's some scenes that are standouts yeah. because, because I mean, like, he's a great actor and he's funny. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, I, I don't, again, same. I don't get it. I, I don't know what, what they were going for with this exactly. Things are resolved. I mean, I do, like, but it's not like... There, yeah, there's are, resolution. Like e- every person, every person he's asked to find shows up at some point in the movie, and like, yeah, we we end with everyone getting to a point. But like, if you ask me, like, draw you a map of like how things are resolved, I I would just no take idea. a crayon and scribble across a page because I have absolutely no idea. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I like your Big Lebowski comparison, which is also a movie that I didn't really like the first time I saw it, and now it's like one of my all time favorites. Yeah. So, you know, I I, I, I love feel the Big like. Lebowski. But unlike the master, which I've given, I've I've tried with the master. I've only seen Inherent Vice a couple of times, and I feel like if I watch it more, I I I think that I might like it more. There are a few like standalone yeah. scenes that, like the scene with Martin Short as a dentist, is amazing and so good. And um, also like the number of actors just kind of like walk into this movie. Like I'm watching, like yeah. oh hey, there's Show up for a scene oh hey, there's leave. Owen Wilson. Oh hey, there's Michael K. Williams. Oh hey, oh hey, there's um. Who, whomever and uh, Benicio del Toro. That's what yeah. I think of. And um, it's great. And it's a and lot. I, it, but it is a lot. And like I, I can't really make heads or tails of like what it, the overall thing is. But I don't know. I enjoy it on like a in scene to scene level more than I enjoy the master. You guys have not sold it to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think I think you should give it a shot. It's on no, HBO Max yeah. right now. That's how I watched it. And again, like maybe just kind of go into the expectation that like the overall overarching thing may not make a whole lot of sense but just kind of like enjoy the journey if 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 you're cool with that um mm-hmm. i think there's a lot to like in it it just was hard for me to like wrap my head around the overarching macro point um which brings me to phantom thread which is his last movie released in 2017 um phantom thread was also one that i saw the first time and i needed that first viewing to like get what the movie was and it took several more viewings to really get what it is. Um, and I think the, mm-hmm. 
I think not unlike Mank and David Fincher's filmography giving me expectations for what Mank was going to be, Paul Thomas Anderson's filmography gave me expectations for what Phantom Thread was going to be. And also the marketing, the trailer, gave me expectations for what the movie was going to be that I think kind of maybe did a disservice to what it actually is. Uh, based on the trailer, I kind of expected this to be like a serious drama about a dressmaker with like a dark secret that we eventually learn. And it's not. Nope, like Phantom Thread, not. Phantom Thread, no. Phantom, Phantom Thread's a romantic comedy. Like it is a straight up romantic comedy, and it's I would except say they forgot the comedy drama. But <laughs> I, you, you are crazy. This movie is hilarious. Like honestly, this movie is hilarious. This movie and is I boring. Think, like, there, are, there are this is a boring go, movie. Oh, go wow. to hell, go to hell, go to hell. This movie is awesome. <laughs> and okay, so I I saw it in theaters. I saw it a second time in theaters, and like both times I saw it in theaters, I loved like the the pieces of it i think just like every other paul thomas Anderson movie the cinematography is amazing the acting is amazing the music is amazing and very good scenes but like i after the first viewing or two i wasn't sure what to make of the whole and then about 10 months later a year later after like it had percolated in my mind for a year and like the the conversation culturally around the movie had kind of percolated for a year i watched it again and it was just it was different the third time watching it like a year later, having, you know, let it let it simmer for a while and like it it is just a romantic comedy. I mean, and maybe I, think I need to rewatch this, it. Because like, uh, I watched it when it was in theaters and yeah. uh you know, before the Oscars and all that. Sure. Uh and yeah, I mean the performances are great and it's it's well made. It's a well made movie, but I, I didn't like it was missing most of the comedic beats that I like from the other uh Paul Thomas Anderson movies, uh, and also that there was no likable characters. None of the people are. I completely disagree. I, mean, I, I don't want to get into the spoilers, disagree. but I have a reason for why I hate every single character in the movie. Okay. <laughs> um. Okay. First the... of all, this is a movie where, hang on, where super serious uh, um, method actor who disappears into his role, um, Daniel, Daniel Day Lewis, chose to name his own character Reynolds Woodcock. That's number so, seven. Correct. That tells you that. <laughs> no, <laughs> yes, and that tells you enough of what the the some of the idea behind this movie. There is a sense of humor behind the movie, even if it isn't straight up in the forefront. But regardless of that, yes, it's a romantic film. It's a romantic drama slash comedy it's a slash whatever comedy. it is. I'm I'm planting a flag but here. It's I'm about. Not, I'm not giving this up. It's a romantic it, comedy. Continue. I mean, to you me, can call it a romantic comedy. Is... That doesn't make it funny. <laughs> <laughs> to me, this is a brilliant uh, portrayal of a toxic, codependent relationship. Yeah, it is a toxic relationship. And toxic, codependent relationship in a very literal sense. I'm not spoiling the movie, but yeah, if you say toxic, it's very, very literal in the film. And it's about these two broken people who can't live without each other. And at the same time, they can't live without hurting each other. So it, it feels like it's messed up. Okay. But except they could live without each other. I also think that the character... Except they could live without each other. In fact, they both did. They were both living and were progressing through life happily. (laughs) <laughs> well, no, I actually think that I actually think that Reynolds Woodcock needs Alma more than Alma needs Reynolds. Well, okay, for sure. But I, I actually, yeah. I, don't, I don't think Alma is a broken character. I think that she, her struggle is to get power in the relationship she's in. Like he has power over her, and she wants to have power over him because otherwise there's a power imbalance mm-hmm. in the relationship. Yeah. So she finds ways to take power in but the relationship. If you do the things that she does yeah. to take that power, you have to be a certain level of broken. <laughs> I think that she's responding to his yeah. brokenness with what she does to take power. She's not broken herself. Or, like he, or he's broken either, in ways or that maybe he, he breaks he, her. Well, no, he's broken in ways. He breaks her, that, and therefore she does stuff to him. He was broken. What she right? does. She, okay, go ahead. What what she does and the way he responds to it indicates more about him than it does about her. Okay, I'll give you that. The fact that he responds positively to what she does yeah. is again. Oh, an indication of him. Yeah, yeah it, it, yes. He is he is definitely messed up. But my point about the, that they were both you know living and they were happy. He was a functional, successful, uh, popular but, dress but designer. But something was missing. But something was missing. But he didn't know that he there did. was anything missing. Well, that's kind of the whole. That's all. Every movie, isn't it? You know, <laughs> I like... suppose. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. 
But I'm saying, like, I like he he would have gone through the rest of his life, you know, content and successful with just his sister helping him, and his sister certainly would have been a lot happier. <laughs> I love his sister, dude. Cyril. I take it back. Cyril's I like Cyril. Awesome. I do like Cyril a lot. Yes, Cyril's and, awesome. Let's and maybe that's why I don't like this movie so much is because I want good things to happen for Cyril. <laughs> and <laughs> Cyril, Cyril's great. What are you talking about? No, but then she, like Cyril? all this stuff comes in and it messes things up for her. She had a good thing Cyril going. Cyril is happy. And and she Cyril was taking care of she was taking care of her brother, uh, and, okay. and then he, he starts he, he, making decisions that put stress on that relationship. And yes, she ultimately he, comes around to it. But you know, you said know. this movie isn't you said this movie isn't funny, and it's romantic comedy with the comedy. He, I want you to watch it again and t- take a step back and realize what a completely ridiculous person Reynolds Woodcock is like. In every interaction he has with his sister, and in every interaction he has with anyone in the movie, and again, he's just a, he's a completely ridiculous person. And maybe that's why re- it doesn't resonate with me because he, right, no one makes any decisions in this movie that any rational person would make. Well, I don't know, but the thing is, like, I, the reason I didn't realize it was a comedy at first, the reason maybe you didn't realize it was a comedy, is like it doesn't look or sound like a comedy. It is a it is a romantic comedy yeah. dressed up as a serious drama. Reynolds Woodcock is an absolute ridiculous little bitch of a person dressed up as this serious dude, but he's not serious. He's a, he's a fucking child. Sorry for cursing, but he is. And like the, the scene True. where the scene where Alma cooks him dinner and like they fight over asparagus over the dinner table in the middle of the movie. Yeah. It's hysterical to me. And like, it, I didn't laugh at it the first time I watched it. I didn't laugh at it the second time I watched it, but the third time I saw it, I was yeah, cracking yeah, up. And that just it's, made me it's ridiculous. <laughs> The, the funniest, the funniest, and my favorite scene in the film is when when he orders breakfast, and she's like, "Oh, uh, breakfast for yes. the for what is it? The hungry boy." Yes, it is. <laughs> I just think that if yeah, if you and if you sausages. watch it, he just keeps adding sausages, a little yes. thing to the order. It's great. <laughs> Rabbit. Um, if I think yeah. if you watch it with the lens, <laughs> Rabbit if you watch with an egg with the lens, on top, not too runny. Watch it with the lens that this is a comedy and Reynolds is a ridiculous person. I think it opens up the movie a little bit more. Okay. Like that scene where over the asparagus is like, do you have a gun? Are you here to kill me? <laughs> and like, it's just, this is over asparagus. And it's, I don't know, it's hilarious to me. Uh, and again, the, everything about the movie, like um, aesthetically is unparalleled. The cinematography, the production design, the, the, the yeah. costume, costume one design Oscar, is, obviously. is phenomenal. Um, and this is the another genre again. Thing. Another Johnny Greenwood score that I have on vinyl. I have the There Will Be Blood and the Phantom Thread scores on vinyl, and I regret nothing with getting those. Um, so, lots to look at, lots to listen to, great performances, and I think really great content about um, the struggles of being in, in an intimate relationship with an artist, and also about the mm. struggles of power dynamics in intimate relationships. And I think um, it's interesting and also hilarious to me. It's romantic comedy. Watch it as such. Um, I mean, maybe I'll give it a shot. You know. <laughs> any other uh, any other thoughts on Phantom Thread or any Paul Thomas Anderson movie? Speaking um, of, hold your peace. Yeah, just just the nuance of Danny Day Lewis being able to do because he's played many British characters and he does an entirely different, at least to my ears. Uh, maybe I don't know how it plays to an American audience, but to my ears, he does an entirely different British accent in every film he's in. Which is entirely different from his actual accent. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that he's he's amazing. He, I guess the, I hope he unretires because he's a. I think right now he's in Tuscany making shoes, or he was before him. COVID. I wish um, you the best. Yeah. Good for you. He was in Tuscany learning to to just make shoes. I um yeah. That's with that's some one thing like I, leather workers or whatever. That's one thing I haven't said yet is that Paul Thomas Anderson. Paul Thomas Anderson is great with actors. Uh, I think that's like pretty apparent. Except for Burt Reynolds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, Burt Reynolds got his only Oscar nomination yeah, in a I mean, movie directed by Paul Thomas Anderson. But um, you, you said that yeah. he didn't like him. So. He's the only one that didn't like that him. Is, yeah. That is a glaring exception. But other than that, like the same people keep coming back to be in yeah. his movies. And, Which is a good um, sign. Yeah, and he, like, is particularly in the case of Magnolia and Boogie Nights, he just, like, keeps expanding the cast because people want parts. And, like, that's, I think, a sign of a, uh, a good director of actors. And, again, like, just that you don't get the performances that you get in The Master or The Old Blood or... Uh, Phantom Thread without being with actors. So I think that's definitely uh, one thing to mention. Any, anything else? Again, I'll not unlike on. Tarantino. Not unlike Tarantino, for sure. Well, I, I, I mean, think the, I think uh, the star of Tarantino's movies, the star of his movies are the writing, though, and the star of Paul Thomas' yeah. movies are the stars. Yeah. And uh, yeah. 
in soggy bottom, he has um, Bradley Cooper uh, in a That's working with him for the first time. Yeah, uh, if you don't, if you Google soggy bottom, the thing that'll come up is pictures of um, Bradley Cooper in 1970s uh, garb and wig and bronzer. His bronzer is uh, remarkable in the uh, <laughs> the set pictures. <laughs> soggy bottom so far so yeah uh, i don't know when we'll get soggy bottom in 2021 but presumably at some point this year i know they wrap production in november so post-production shouldn't take 13 months i'm assuming we'll see it at some point in 2021 and uh, i can't wait um he's he's a guy whose movies i'll see on opening night um and i'll mark my calendar and i'll see it multiple times i would if they released on opening night that's true. Sorry, uh, they really, <laughs> his 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 movies specifically they never come out the same day because because they are marketed as prestige dramas, so they only always come out like a month or two later. Unfortunately, they but do usually have a movies, yeah. they usually have a platform release, but luckily I live in Los Angeles, so I am always in the city in when LA. they open yeah. immediately. So hello, Boo. Boo Los <laughs> Angeles bias. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's the center of culture, Grizz. I can't I can't help that, man. Yeah, well, how's your barbecue? <laughs> actually, really good. Yeah, I mean, I it's know. not Texas barbecue. It's not Texas. It's actually, it probably is yeah. Texas barbecue. It's a transplant of someone from Texas well, <laughs> came out I'm there. I'm from I'm from St. Louis, and St. Louis also has really, really good, good barbecue. barbecue. Maybe top five cities in the country for barbecue. So <laughs> I have high standards. L is pretty uh, good. Though, are we really are we really going to talk about food? Are we really going to talk about food right now? Yeah, it's I mean, Italian, we Italian. have, we have food all the best Russian. food in the world comes to the United States. You just get Italian food. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> yeah. L.A., you can get great tacos, great barbecue, great Italian, great Houston dinner, and L.A. actually have a lot yeah. in common in terms of demographic. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Uh, um, okay, well, so we need to talk about uh, next week's episode real quick. Do we, do we have a film to remember for next week? We no, about? that's what we need to talk about real quick. Oh, okay. <laughs> so our topic for next week. <laughs> Uh, is Mark Wahlberg, Boone or Bane, where we will discuss whether or not Mark Wahlberg uh, is is a, good for a movie or if he sets expectations at a certain level. Uh, you know, We'll get into all that next week. But so for our... Uh, Can, what's what's up, the clock right now, Josh? The what? what? What is the clock right now, Josh? One forty six. What's our run time? Yeah. Yeah. Do, we, uh, do we want to split it and, and do Mark Wahlberg the week after? Or should we just, just just leave it out? What do you think, Chris? I don't know how we would Since split not, it because we don't have next, an editor. At that's the moment. true. We don't have an editor so right now. So this think, one's oh, going up oh, in one damn. part. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, All right. That's so just a long one. That's fine. It's just going to be a long one. Uh, and it was a lot of really good content. So I don't, I don't apologize for that. Uh, but for our yeah, film yeah. to remember, oh, let's decide right now. We uh, enjoy the monologuing. Are we doing... Uh, I'm going to give you three options. The Happening, Ted, or The Departed. I would want to talk about The Departed in a context that is more than just Mark Wahlberg. So I'm going to eliminate The Departed and okay. say either Ted or The Happening. So I eliminated one. You guys can talk about the remaining two. Um, yeah, Hugo's, I'm, Hugo's I'm voting not going to be happening. around for the whole episode next week. Because, <laughs> look, the hap- it's, it's, it's going to be funny to talk about The Happening. Um And also, Ted, I've seen it already, and I, I don't know if I want to watch it again. Okay. okay. So then, Sounds I like guess we're, gonna watch, we're gonna watch the happening. Are you sure, are you, sure you don't want to add the departed? Are you sure you don't want to add the departed to our list? That could be a fun one. Even though, I mean, the departed's one of my all-time favorite movies. Think? But I think we would want to. I think Josh I'm wants down. to talk about it I'm in the to context re-watch. of Scorsese like, more than he wants to talk about it in the look, context. We're of eventually Correct. gonna. I think I'm, I'm just gonna throw this out there. We're eventually Scorsese episode probably, so we'll talk about it again. You know. But we can do the departed. You, like I'm actually fine with that. Let's like, do the departed. Might... Let's do the okay. departed. Let's do the departed. All right, cool. Let, let's do a good one. Let's not let's make do a fun good of movie. a movie let's... for twenty minutes. <laughs> like the, for the film to remember segment, my idea behind it is yeah. that at worst it's a decent movie that we're going to talk about. I yeah. don't want to okay. force yeah. people to watch a horrible movie uh, only for <laughs> us to rank it at the bottom of the list because it's a horrible movie. Let's let's yeah, at least go fair. for decent movies. <laughs> So, the film to remember for All next right. week is The Departed. <laughs> Sweet. Yes. All right, cool. Well, and I'll be around for that and then leave the episode because I'm way too busy next week. Me, so me and Grizz will land that. the ship next week. So That's right. Yes. So, thanks for joining us. Uh, remember to like, subscribe, and share. 
and uh, and comment. I would actually like some interaction if you want to uh, give us your thoughts on Paul Thomas Anderson. We'd really appreciate that. And uh, we will see you guys next week.